I've tried doing this a bunch of different ways by now. I'm not sure if I should read off the script that I wrote. I mean, I've already done that and I didn't really like it. I'm not sure what I should really do here. I don't know if I'm cut out for this. And I don't mean the movies. I mean making a YouTube video. I mean, I'm really not that interesting. I guess we can start off with uh, the obvious choice. I skipped the first category because it's mostly normal horror movies, which, you know, will scare you if you are a normal moviegoer, if you don't have hundreds of movies under your belt, or if you're just generally not the biggest horror fan. Um, you know, things like Scream, Insidious, The Conjuring, etc. They're gonna shake you up a little bit, you're not gonna sleep particularly well, but for my money, it's all stuff that I've seen before, so... I skipped this category also because I want to watch movies that I haven't seen before. This whole list is not just about me trying to push my limits and see if I will be disturbed by these films, but it's also about just seeing new things that I haven't seen before. So that's why I skipped the first category. The second category is Grindhouse. In this category, I have actually seen most of the stuff as well. I've seen the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. It was disturbing, but didn't blow my mind. Same thing with Saw. Same thing with Human Centipede, Hostel, Midsummer. I mean, they're good movies. They're not bad quality movies. I think Midsummer. some people love it, some people hate it. Hostel is amusing to me personally because I have a friend where when we were in our teens, maybe when we were like 13 years old or something uh, my early teens I had a friend whose name is Peter and Peter had seen Hostel and he said it's the most disturbing movie he'd ever seen and he couldn't he almost couldn't even sit through it it was so bad so you know fast forward a few years and I eventually watched it myself he scared me a little bit off of it I'm not gonna lie but I watched it, you know, later uh, when we were a bit older and it wasn't particularly bad to me. It is a, there is torture in the movie, so it is, it does get pretty bad. But I wasn't uh, shaken to the core the way he was, probably due to the, the difference in age and the fact that I chose to wait a little bit. So I'm glad I did that. But the three movies on Wendigoon's list that I haven't seen in this category were... Uh, the Hills of Eyes, House of a Thousand Corpses, and Tusk, which I have now seen. I'm gonna give you my sort of general impressions of it. I think The Hills Have Eyes is a thriller. I don't think it's a horror movie. It is an older one, so it makes sense that it wouldn't disturb me that much, but I shouldn't say that twice because there are some older movies that can get really, really nasty as well. I think The Hills Have Eyes is just kind of like, how should I put this? It's scary if deformed or scary faces are scary to you. That's kind of it. So that one didn't disturb me. Uh, House of a Thousand Corpses, though, that one hit me nastily, and I slept pretty poorly after that one. I think... Oh, man. Um, that movie was a bit of a wake-up call as to what I am doing right now. I think it is much more disturbing than it looks like on paper. It is a concept movie. What I mean when I say it's a concept movie is that there's an obvious idea that they're trying to execute. And the idea is that you are going through a haunted house, but it's a movie instead of an actual haunted house in real life. When I say haunted house, what I mean is those, I don't know if that's what they're called, but uh, just like the, the American horror houses. I'm European, but in America, they have those Halloween things, right? You go into some building that somebody put a bunch of work into that's very disturbing, and maybe there's some people in there who come after you, or maybe not. I guess it depends where you go. And this movie is trying to be that, but like the movie version of it. And while that's that's very cute, and I'm never not gonna laugh at watching Rain Wilson getting chopped to bits. I mean, I love that guy. He's he's hilarious in The Office, and he's, he's hilarious in this one. But as funny and as comedic as the movie is, it has some really insane things in it. Like, this is making me realize if I'm having trouble sitting through House of a Thousand Corpses, I'm not sure I can do this. Uh, so, yeah, that was a tough one. I think what helps with it, though, is that the characters are more caricatures than they are human. <laughs> they basically act in very exaggerated ways that no one would really be like that in real life. And that does 
kind of take the edge off, but also not really, because as amusing and as fun as the movie is, it still has those ridiculously insane uh, moments that you really don't want to look at. So th this was a tough one for me. I also saw Tusk, which was pretty easy to sit through. Um, Tusk is a very bad movie. It doesn't have anything particularly disturbing in it. It's supposed to be kind of like a body horror uh, movie, but it, in my opinion, it, it doesn't really achieve the horror part of what we call the body horror genre because it's supposed to be scary and Tusk just isn't. It's just a crazy niche, uh, you know, not for everyone kind of movie. You know, I, you know what? I think Tusk is very disturbing if you go into it not knowing what it is. And I guess that was the problem, is that if you think Tusk is an innocent dark comedy movie, it's gonna wreck you really, really hard just because you don't expect how nasty it is. But I'm coming into this from the perspective of there's gonna be a lot of nasty things that I'm gonna watch on this list. And with that perspective, Tusk was kind of a joke and it wasn't anywhere near as scary as House of a Thousand Corpses to me. Moving on to tier three exploitation, I would like to just say a few words on the category as a whole, as well as the individual movies in the category that I have already seen before I dive into the individual uh, movies uh, that I haven't seen that I'm going to watch. So first of all, the thing that immediately comes to mind when I see this category is, oh my God, this is the category of movies where when I searched for most disturbing movies ever made. Um, you know, I don't I don't remember when I did this, but this was like way before this iceberg was ever made uh, by anyone on the internet and shared. But uh, I think this was like five or 10 years ago. I don't know. But uh, at least a handful of years ago, I tried to sort of find like, what's the most hardcore stuff that exists out there? And I'm looking at this category right now, and I'm kind of thinking, you know what? This is where all of those answers that people had on the internet and on forums and YouTube videos to that question. And I'm actually surprised by how much of this stuff I've already seen. There is more stuff here than the previous category uh, that I haven't seen. But the fact that I've seen anything uh, is surprising to me. Uh, Sallow or 120 Days of uh, Sodom or whatever it's called, I've seen that one, I've seen The Human Centipede 2, uh, I've seen Martyrs, I've seen a Serbian film, and also The House That Jack Built. So quite a bit, actually. Uh, I'm gonna go through them as well because I think they deserve the time. Sallow is interesting because it's a movie that really, its reputation precedes it in a big way. And I barely remember anything from the movie. The only thing I remember from it was that I wasn't particularly shocked or disturbed by it. I think Salo has the problem of having disturbed a lot of people very deeply um, many years ago. And so you're kind of coming into it with the expectation that it's gonna make you throw up. And then when it doesn't, you're like, well, it didn't make me throw up. So I guess it wasn't that bad. So yeah, Salo is um, to my memory, not really that difficult to sit through, to be honest. The Human Centipede 2, I also remember watching that, is basically just a pile of garbage. I don't have anything clever to say about it. It's not a clever movie. It's not really that disturbing either. To me, it's actually less disturbing than The Human Centipede 1 because the first movie had a feeling of, uh, I don't want to say realism, but like you can watch it and suspend your disbelief, whereas in this movie, you kind of can't because it has that element of absurdity. It's the same element of absurdity that makes House of a Thousand Corpses watchable, but I think the expectation is is what changes it again. It, it's kind of similar to Sallow for me, is that, you know, the reason why House of a Thousand Corpses was so disturbing to me is because it caught me off guard. It's not because it has murder in it, it's because I didn't expect it to have violent torture in it, which it does. I expected Sallow and Human Centipede 2 to have those things in it, and it does, but beyond that, there's not a lot to really push your limits. It just kind of is what it is. Martyrs I also want to talk about because I hate that movie with a burning passion. I do remember it. It is a very disturbing and nasty movie. For me, Martyrs is, I, I remember it being way more difficult to get through than anything else on this list. 
It's tougher than a Serbian film. It's tougher than a house that Jack built. Anything, really, that I've seen so far. And that's purely because Martyrs has sort of torture elements and just elements of pain that are just downright difficult to look at. And it's as simple as that. And sometimes to disturb a person, that's all you need. The problem that I have with the movie is that it tries to be clever and philosophical, and it really isn't. It kind of throws a little bit of like thought-provoking, almost, it's almost like a spiritual thing that it throws in your direction at the end, but it doesn't answer any of it. It doesn't even ans it doesn't even ask further questions or it doesn't debate anything. It just tries to be something that it isn't and then ends, and I hate that. The reason I hate it so much is because it's like Martyrs wants to use its philosophical aspect as a justification for the pure insanity that actually happens to the characters in the movie and the way they are displayed visually and all of the way all of that is depicted. And the simple truth is that it, it doesn't excuse it at all. It's just terrible with terrible on top. So that's why I hate Martyrs so much. I know some people love it. Some people actually like that little tiny little bit of thought provoking, you know, whatever that was at the end. I don't think it's enough. I think it's pretentious and stupid and I hate it. A Serbian film, not the most disturbing movie I've ever seen. I guess it gets people because of the family and the pornography aspect. Uh, which are two things you really, really don't want to combine, and a Serbian film combines them. So I think that takes people off guard and shocks them, but I've seen worse. And finally, The House That Jack Built. I love that movie. The House That Jack Built is everything that Martyrs isn't, in my opinion. It actually has real commentary on some things that are so insane and difficult to even think about that uh, it boggles the mind that the movie manages to actually be good at all, and it is. Out of all of these, I would say the most disturbing one is Martyrs, but it's also the one that I hate the most and the one that I recommend the least. The least disturbing one is probably The House That Jack Built, or maybe The Human Centipede 2, depending on what your expectations are and how a, f a feeling of realism or absurdity skews how you perceive a movie. Human Centipede 2 is much more absurd, but it's also more extreme in what happens. Whereas The House of Jack build is absurd, but it feels much more real. Like, I don't know why, it just feels more real. So I guess it depends how you feel about stuff like that, but yeah. I recommend watching The House of Jack build. I think it's actually a good movie. The rest of it you can skip if you're watching this stuff for quality, but then again, who really is? I don't think any of us are watching these things for quality anymore. I think if you've entered tier 3 exploitation, as it's called, it's not about the quality anymore, which is why it's so surprising that uh, that there is actually a movie that has some decent quality, in my opinion. I just watched Pink Flamingos, and I am shocked that it's possible to make a movie that is so disgusting and boring at the same time. You would think that the sheer amount of grossness in this movie would somehow make it entertaining or interesting, but it really doesn't, and the pacing of this movie is actually terrible. So from a film technical point of view, it is a god-awful movie, and there is... I guess the only redeeming quality of this movie is that the soundtrack is not the worst thing I've ever heard in my life. But beyond that, man, this is a bad movie. Genuinely, the way it's produced, written, what's actually happening on screen, everything. It's just super trash. Uh, and I don't mean trash in a good way. I mean, there's nothing of artistic merit here. Uh, beyond that, this is not disturbing at all. It's a very disgusting movie, and I guess... That's always going to be a discussion, you know, that'll never end. Is something disturbing because it's disgusting? I mean, aren't all disturbing movies disgusting in some way or make you feel disgusted in some way or another? But, you know, no matter how you slice it, this just isn't a scary movie and uh, not a disturbing one either. It's just gross. You're gonna be fine with the filth in this movie if you've seen Salo. I think you will, you know, you can get through this one, but why would you, honestly? There's no enjoyment to be had here. There's nothing that's gonna push your limits either. It's just a bunch of nothing, really. You know, 90 minutes of something that should have been an hour long, but ideally should have never been made, to be honest. I should talk about some of the specifics here. Uh, there's genitalia in the movie, and... 
you uh, watch them do things. Uh, but what really is a kind of bothersome is the fucking chicken scene. Uh, there's a scene involving some chicken which is difficult to comprehend. It actually looks like one of the chicken died from that scene. Given the fact that I'm against animal cruelty and animal abuse, uh, it's difficult for me to have a lot of respect for the movie's director when you do stuff like this to animals. So, mm, watching what was probably real animal cruelty does make me sad. So, yeah, this movie doesn't really justify its existence in any way, shape, or form. It's just terrible. But it's also not disturbing, so if that's what you're looking for, you're not even gonna get that. I'm trying to gather my thoughts on Cannibal Holocaust because I actually have, uh, I think I have a lot of things that I want to say about it, but I don't really know where to start. It's definitely better than Tusk and Pink Flamingos, that's for sure. Come to think of it, that doesn't really say much because Almost anything I've seen in my entire life is better than those two movies. <laughs> I'm not sure. It's not the worst movie I've ever seen. When I was halfway through this one, I actually thought, okay, this is a genuinely good movie. And then the second half, uh, well, I don't know. It, it becomes a bit more debatable, let's say. I think what's, what's nice about this movie is that it does have a, almost kind of a wholesome or... To me, at least, a heartwarming, you reap what you sow kind of a message, you know? And that's despite the contents of what actually happens in the film. I think this movie fits the exploitation category perfectly, because that is exactly what it is. This is admittedly a movie with horrible people doing horrible things to other people, where we can't deny that, that is... That stuff is in here, but I mean, it fits the genre, and I think if you don't know what you're getting into at this point, this movie is infamous and has been so for almost 45 years now, so it it wasn't a shocker for me, but what was, again, and, and this is the same as with Pink Flamingos, is the parts of the, of the movie that disturb me the most is the non-fictional stuff, and what I mean by that is that like in with Pink Flamingos, in this one we are also talking about uh, animal cruelty, sadly, which, as I said previously, I am against it, uh, I do not condone it, and I don't enjoy looking at it. This movie has a lot of animal death scenes, more so than you would like. That being said, I'm not gonna make a huge fuss about it in this one, because uh, similarly to, say, a movie like Apocalypse Now, the animal deaths in this movie, although they are very real, they are also clean and quick. So because they are clean and quick kills, it doesn't really disturb me that much. And I thank, you know, I thank the heavens for the fact that those animals didn't have to suffer more than they did. But there is actually one uh, animal killing. It's the first one in the movie, the very first one, which in my opinion is too slow and it's not it's not as clean and quick as it should be, and that does bother me. I just don't like that at all. I think it's horrible. It is in the movie if you can get over it. Then the movie does actually have some uh, real substance to it, which I think there is something to appreciate here. I think the story structure is very original for its time. The whole concept of somebody going to the jungle to recover footage from a crew that went there previously and then recovering that footage and then looking at it and going, okay, this is pretty insane. That story structure, I actually enjoy that. I thought it was creative. I thought it was cool. The other original thing about it is the, fine, the found footage aspect. This is kind of a found footage movie, not the whole thing, but it has snippets of found footage in it which does add to the feeling of realism and it adds to the experience in my opinion. There are things like cannibalism and sexual abuse depicted in the movie. Luckily, obviously, that stuff isn't real. That would make it a snuff movie, a snuff film, excuse me, which is what people actually thought it was original, which, which is why it got banned in so many countries when it came out. And that's what this whole controversy with this movie was about, is that people actually thought the actors and actresses had really died for this footage, which was later proven to be, well, not correct. In hindsight, you know... That is kind of hilarious, and it is kind of funny that the director was 
brought to court for making this movie and, and trying to get his movie out there. As amusing as it is, though, you can see why people would be tricked by it and why they would think that this stuff is real, because the practical effects in this movie are actually immaculate. I think they're fantastic. I think the impalement scene is... It, it's a puzzling achievement because you look at it and you don't really understand how they did that. It looks very real. You know, it's an older movie, and you're wondering how did they make that without killing a person, because it actually looks really, really good. Uh, so that is surprising. It is. And I don't blame people for, for thinking that this stuff was real back when it came out. You know, I, I imagine that this must have absolutely shocked people back in the day. Uh, truly, I, I think it did. That being said, Excuse me, actually, it, it, uh, I was going to say the, the animal killings is what's tough for me. Uh, specifically because you know they're real, and you don't just see animals being killed, you also see a turtle getting butchered, uh, which is very gruesome and difficult to look at. You know, I needed a, a short break after that one before I could continue with the movie. But even that scene, which I hated so much, ends up serving a real storytelling purpose in the movie because the butchering of that turtle, poetically enough, it completely mirrors what happens to that bastard film crew later on in the movie. I also think that this movie has some pretty strong commentary on uh, journalism ethics in general and the exploitation of other cultures than conventional, as we would call it, civilized Western culture. And I don't think that those commentaries are lost in the movie's violence or gruesomeness or cruelty. That meta-commentary on what exploitation is, including the movie in and of itself within its own genre, is pretty clever. It's I'm not saying it's a genius movie or anything, but I'm saying I see what the movie is telling me and I appreciate that. Does that justify the amount of violence in the movie? Well, that depends on how much you can take. I mean, I'm not trying to sound like a tough guy or, or a sociopath over here, but yeah, I've seen worse. Tetsuo, the Iron Man. This one is uh, very odd, very weird. I'm gonna be honest, half the time watching this thing, I don't know what is going on. It's a very visually confusing movie. It's only an hour and five minutes long, and thank God for that. This movie is not particularly disturbing. Wendigoon describes it as a metal melt movie after doing his research and having watched it. Yeah, that is that is exactly what it is. But I will say there's an element of sort of, it feels kind of like a psychedelic movie gone wrong because I almost can't even call it a coherent narrative. I mean, it's so difficult to see what is happening or to understand what is supposed to be happening with the characters in the movie. I mean, I didn't even understand who was dead at what time. Like, sometimes the characters are dead, and then they're not dead, but then they're dead anyways, but they're not actually dead, and yeah, it gets really odd. I mean, in terms of storytelling, there's really nothing here. It's just super bad. At times, it feels like this movie was written by a seven-year-old, but at the same time, kind of not, because we've obviously left family-friendly a long time ago. So it's a weird combination of immaturity and mature themes. I will say though, if you didn't laugh during this movie, I think you've misunderstood something because some of this shit is hilarious. I think the lack of a clear narrative is what really ruins this one for me, but it is admittedly a funny movie and because it's so short, it doesn't really overstay its welcome, which I guess is what I like about it. In the end, I think the only question I have for this movie is, can it go flaccid, or is it always like that? And then it just starts spinning when he gets excited? I'm confused and curious. Anatomically, I mean, I would like to know. Coming right off having watched uh, Midori, and it's not as bad as I thought. And I don't mean in terms of quality, I mean in terms of how difficult it is to get through this one. If we're talking about quality, I think the movie is okay. Uh, the animation is, I mean, you can tell that this movie is mostly just done by one single person. It's a lot of still drawings that are being panned over by the camera, so to speak. And then you have some sound design and some voice acting behind it. And that's kind of, you know, the technicality of how the movie is made and how it looks. There are moments in this movie that look really good. And then there's, you know, 
the other stuff, which is okay. It's not a visually terrible movie, but I think what what's what's much more challenging about this movie isn't talking about the quality, but <laughs> the the disturbing kind of aftertaste that it leaves you with when you're done with it. Now, to be completely, you know, honest about this, it didn't disturb me or freak me out as much as I thought it would. In fact, I just finished it 10 minutes ago, and I'm, I'm not freaked out at all. Uh, the movie's definitely bleak, don't get me wrong. It's perplexing, it's a little confusing, it's a little bit hypnotic, it's a little odd, and it obviously has some mature and pretty disturbing themes in it, and, and there's some things that happen. You know, there's abuse, child abuse uh, of the sexual kind. Obviously, that's not easy to... to to sit through and to watch, and that is challenging. It just leaves you with that emptiness kind of feeling. Uh, this movie definitely has that kind of bleak emotion to it. Uh, that being said, I believe that exploring that in, in a movie is a very real part of the human experience, and I'm not against that. But it's obvious that along with m mostly the rest of the movies in this category, this is obviously wildly inappropriate for younger audiences to watch. And I can understand why it was banned in Japan and then remade with some uh, censorship in it where they kind of change things around because, um, yeah, this movie is unflinching. So I'm not going to say, you know, it's the most disturbing movie ever, but it is a movie that very obviously goes into uh, the darker recesses of the human experience. If you resonate with that, then, you know, go for it. It's always different from person to person, you know, how much you can take and what you're willing to watch. I guess the last thing I want to say is, obviously, don't devalue the degree to which this movie can hit you, though, just because it's an animation. When Midori came out originally, it was received extremely poorly, and people thought it was the worst thing they'd ever seen, and they absolutely hated it. And nowadays, there's people claiming the opposite and saying that it's a masterpiece and everything. I think Midori is neither, but I do believe that Midori achieves what it tries to achieve because it really does show you, you know, this is what it looks like for the most unfortunate 1% of people. And that's brutal and that's cruel, but that's what the movie shows. Suicide Club, funky little movie, tries to be very philosophical, which is odd considering the pretty grotesque horror elements of this movie. It is about exactly what you think it is about, and... I don't think it tackles the subject matter with a lot of grace, sadly. It is in some ways a pretty artsy film. It tries to be multiple things. It tries to have a sort of detective crime drama aspect. And it also has it also has some comments on young culture and being easily influenced by your surroundings and uh, the power of the internet, and, you know, there's some social commentary in there as well, and then there's also some pretty pitch black and insane humor. Similarly to a lot of movies on uh, the list in this particular category, Suicide Club is not as disturbing as I thought it would be when I went into it. It does have some pretty crazy things, but the problem is that this movie peaks in its craziness within the first five minutes of its runtime. And this thing is an hour and 40 minutes long, so this is a slow, slow movie, and it tries to do a lot of things, and it tries to be a lot of things, and it kind of succeeds in a lot of it, and then also fails at the same time, so it's a bit tough for me to evaluate it. It is too slow, and it is too long, and it does blow its load way too quickly. So, you know, the movie has problems, for sure. I guess the problem is that things just get a bit too weird and convoluted, to where I'm not sure I understood the message here, if there is one. I think that if you're dealing with a subject such as suicide, you have to have a certain specificity or purpose or uh, grace with which you navigate that subject. And uh, Suicide Club is a bit too all over the place to really be that. Uh, there's just so many scenes that end up being completely nonsensical. Uh, the most noble intention here is obviously to point out the fact that Japan has and has always had a really, really massive social issue with 
insane suicide rates. I mean, this is this is reality. This is a, a good intention, I believe, behind this movie. But actually delivering some kind of message, or or clever, uh, or informative, or human. Uh, commentary on that it fall it falls flat sadly if you make your movie about this and then you make it impossible to understand what your message is on just viewing the movie i think you failed uh, it ends with basically saying you should live as you please but it doesn't have any commentary on Okay, does living as you please mean that you should kill yourself if you want, or does it mean that you shouldn't, and that you should believe in your future and always have hope? There's just not a lot, there's not a lot to hold on to here, message-wise. If you have any personal history with self-harm or suicide attempts, obviously stay away from this movie. Maybe think twice before you sit down and watch 54 Japanese schoolgirls jumping out in front of a train. Other than that, I think this was pretty generic and slow. Before we move on to tier 4, I just want to say a quick word about what are actually the things that I feel like I've seen that would be a 10 out of 10, that would be the most disturbing things I've ever seen, because I've been sitting here and kind of rating these movies with, with like a little scale and, and giving a very subjective uh, number for each movie for how I felt when I experienced the movie. Uh, so I feel like it's fair for, for you guys to kind of get a little bit of a yardstick. And uh, I also want to talk a little bit about what's disturbed me the, the most so far, because I have a feeling that that's about to change. And I'm entering tier 4 with an extreme amount of trepidation. Tier 2 and tier 3 have been surprisingly okay for me to get through. I didn't expect it to be this okay. I thought they were gonna hit me harder. So far, the, the only two movies on this challenge that have actually really gotten to me is House of a Thousand Corpses from tier 2 and Cannibal Holocaust from tier 3. And even those two movies were definitely tolerable for me. Uh, so I feel very okay right now. I just don't think that that's going to continue. So while I still have uh, my sanity and my relative innocence, uh, I would like to mention that probably when I think of the most disturbing movies I've ever seen, I am admittedly thinking about Martyrs and also a movie called Bone Tomahawk. Uh, Martyrs comes to mind because as much as I've talked about the fact that I hate that movie, and I do, uh, and I do think it's overblown, it does have probably the most amount of just physical and mental torture that I've ever seen in a film, and that by itself carries a lot of weight because that's just very difficult for me to sit through. The truth is the truth, and physical pain and, and mental pain disturbs me greatly. You know, let's not forget that Martyrs is a story about somebody who's been tortured, who's been traumatized, goes back to take their revenge, and then becomes tortured again. Like, could you possibly imagine a worse scenario for a human being? Bone Tomahawk comes to mind for me because it's such a grounded feeling movie. Everything about that movie feels real for so long. You can buy into the characters, you're getting sucked into to the story and into the world. And when shit hits the fan in a movie like that, it feels very, very, very bad. And it, it's, it's very shocking for that reason. So that's why Martyrs and Bone Tomahawk would be kind of 10 out of 10 disturbing for me. I also want to talk a little bit about some anime, because I have seen a couple anime that are also at that level. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, namely, Clan Ad After Story and an anime called Berserk. I think it's from 1997, if I remember correctly. Clan Ad After Story is about family, but it's about grief and loss and the pain of that. Uh, and again, it's one of those things where the more real something feels, and the more you get to know and like the characters of the show, the more badly it hurts you when, when something terrible happens to those characters. Uh, and I think that Clan and After Story, as amazing of an anime as it is, and it is incredible, it's very, very well made, and you definitely should watch it, I, I do recommend it, it also hurts badly. Berserk also makes the list, because Berserk is 
just a very extreme story. I mean, whether you read the manga or, or you want to watch the 1997 uh, TV show, it's basically a recipe for how to get PTSD. That is the metaphor. B Berserk is a metaphor for, for post-traumatic stress disorder. Like, there's so much trauma and insanity and abuse in every way imaginable. Torture, sexual abuse, etc. And it's happening to characters that you get to know as, as people, you know? So it feels like this stuff is happening to something that is almost equivalent to real human beings. Uh, so that's why Berserk is so tough as well. I also want to just give a quick little mention to a video game called Doki Doki Literature Club. I know it sounds hilarious. It's a Trojan horse, basically. It it, it seems so girly and, and childish and stupid and almost feels like a waste of time for a while. Uh, and then when it uh, when the true nature of, of uh, DDLC rears its ugly head, it's quite shocking. So those are kind of the pieces of media that have disturbed me the most. I mean, unless you want to also count some of the messed up Japanese, like, niche horror movies or torture porn movies that I have seen. Like, Ichi the Killer, I think it's called, is one of the movies I saw a long time ago. I've also seen a few other ones. I may or may not have seen Guinea Pig uh, already, but I don't remember. So, you know, the, the whole Japanese extremist movies... I don't think it's completely foreign to me, but I also don't remember well enough to definitively say that I've been there and done that. Kicking us off with the oldest of the bunch in Tier 4 is Viva la Muerte. The movie starts off with the camera panning across uh, a drawing of a lot of medieval torture and execution methods. And for some odd reason, and this took me off guard, there's a Danish children's song, I think it's from the 1960s, that is being sung by a kid that is playing in the background while the camera is panning across this uh, quite disturbing imagery. And I never thought I'd have to say this in order to review a movie, but I'm Danish and I just didn't expect uh, my native language to be, you know, the song of uh, the first tier four movie in its intro. It's, it was very weird to me and just completely took me off guard. It actually intimidated me a little bit because I have, you know, I've been scared for a while of diving into tier four and then starting off like that. I really thought that that was going to be a sign for things to come. Luckily, it wasn't though because this movie is actually really easy to watch uh, it's in my opinion it's mostly just a normal slightly heartbreaking story interspliced with the occasional disgusting or unsettling imagery obviously if you come into this movie with the idea that it's just going to be a completely normal movie then yeah there's going to be some shock value but cleaning up my lawn this afternoon was tougher than getting through this movie so I might have nightmares about raking leaves and putting them in plastic bags, but I'm not going to have nightmares about this movie, I don't think. I know that sounds like a joke, but honestly, there's going to be movies, just normie horror movies from tier one that are as disturbing as this movie, for sure. Uh, I will say there is a scene with a bull where a bull is killed and then a man is, you know, it's opened, so to speak, and a man is stuffed inside the bull. It's quite disgusting. Again, I've talked about animal cruelty before with these movies, and I don't approve of it. I don't know if they actually really killed a, a, a bull to, to make that scene. If they did, then I don't approve of it, but it is what it is. Uh, and then there's a surgery scene after that involving the main character, who's just, he's just a little boy, and that is also a little uh, disgusting and, and tough to get through. If you work in a hospital, this is nothing for you. You can easily, easily stomach this. Other than that, the girl with the turkey was really cool. I don't know, pretty easy watch, to be honest, and um, I'm glad I started off with this. And this is why I always start off with the oldest movies as well, because honestly, they're just not as tough as some of the newer stuff. So, you know, 1971, is this really an extremist movie? Does it really fit the category? I'm not sure. Maybe I will be able to, to evaluate that better once I've seen some more movies. If you approach it not knowing what it is, it's going to surprise you, and that's that's going to have some shock value, sure. But other than that, it's uh, just another movie. Ugh, fuck. I guess we're in this shit now. Fucking Japan, bro. What the fuck?
Well, I guess the initial mystery of whether or not I had actually watched Guinea Pig before and then forgotten about it is solved. I had not. I have now. Yuck. <laughs> it's tough to talk about because it's just so depressing that it makes you not want to talk. This is just straight up Japanese torture porn. It's made to look like a realistic representation of what happens to the body and how much it can handle until it shuts down, basically. Uh, in case anyone's curious, we're talking beatings, sound torture, they use boiling oil, they use uh, some tools, they use a knife, they use a mallet uh, to the hand, and then of course there's the infamous final scene with the piercing of the retina. It's fucking disgusting. This movie is, is disgusting dog shit. You'd be hard pressed to even call it a movie. The characters are completely dehumanized. <laughs> characters. What am I talking about? There are no characters in this movie. There's just the victim and the perpetrators. This is there's no character of work. There's no dialogue. There's no backstory. No story is being told. Nothing. Devil's Experiment is less than 45 minutes long. It took me a solid one and a half hour to get through this shit. I started watching at 11 o'clock. It's two o'clock now and I still haven't eaten yet. That should probably give you a pretty good idea of what kind of fucking sludge, disgusting, subhuman, ocean-dwelling, deep-sea creature dog shit we're talking about here. <sighs> okay, luckily, some of the stuff in guinea pig looks a little fake, and thank god for that, because it allows me to hold on to my disbelief. But unfortunately, a lot of it looks pretty real. It is made to look like snuff, even though it's obviously not a real snuff movie. If it was, I wouldn't have even considered getting my hands on it, let alone watching it. But sadly, it is semi-realistic in its representation, and that is... It's just very disgusting, very messed up. There's no content here other than just the pain of what happens. It's not easy to sit through this. I think the screaming is what really fires up the mirror neurons for me. But the final scene that is so disgusting is there's no screaming in it, which is also very disturbing because it depicts that, you know, she's done. She's completely exhausted, done for. And you just sit there and imagine the pain. Horrible experience. I can... I'm, I'm starting to understand the not safe for life tag in this tier because between Viva la Muerte and guinea pig, we've gone from zero to a hundred real fucking quick. While Viva la Muerte did have disgusting things in it, it was at least a real movie that I could recommend in a pinch to a fellow degenerate. Guinea pig, we are well into the territory of cannot recommend this to anyone ever, no matter who you are, I don't care how hard your dick got when you watched The Human Centipede, you are not watching this shit. I mean, I can't really see the appeal, to be honest. It's really not that interesting watching a woman getting destroyed over the course of 40 minutes. And it's slow, too. Those 40 minutes don't feel like 40 minutes. They feel like 40 fucking hours. I want to make funny comments like buckle up and uh, make sure you haven't eaten anything and uh, don't watch if you have a heart condition and whatever else. But all of that is just jokes because just don't watch it, you know? Like, at all. There was one thing going through my mind the whole time watching this movie, okay? Scene one, I was just like, why? Scene two, why? Third scene, why? All the way through the movie, I was just sitting here going, why, why, why? Why am I watching this shit? Why would you make this? Why? I hated it. I hated everything about it. Well, this was a very bad time. Welcome to the real tier four stuff, I guess. Yowie wowie. Alright, guinea pig, flower and flesh and blood, much much easier to get through than the first one. It starts off with a scene where a chicken is beheaded and it looks very fake and it sounds very fake. And that pretty much sets the tone for the whole, uh, the whole thing. The sound effects in this one are very funny and the practical effects tend to look mostly fake. The stuff that does look decent or isn't too fake looking is admittedly very, very, very disgusting. So it's by no means easy to get through this one, but it's definitely a 
at least a notch down from the, the first guinea pig. There are some sound effects and some editing choices and some cuts and some zooms that are very comedic, which helps hold on to the disbelief and the sanity, so to speak, which is very nice. I appreciate that. It is amusing that this was the film that allegedly made Charlie Sheen call the FBI and not the first one, because when you compare the two, the first one is substantially more disturbing and it feels a lot more real, whereas this one is more surreal, it doesn't have the same feeling of reality to it, but it still has that extremist tastelessness in it. Uh, so it is a terrible, terrible movie, don't get me wrong. There's a little more dialogue and a little more character work in this one, but that doesn't really say much because there was nothing in, in, in The Devil's Experiment. We would all have done the same thing as Charlie Sheen and, and reported it to at least some sort of authority if it was 1985 and we watched this. But by modern standards, the effects are quite laughable. Well, I mean, some of it is pretty, like I said, some of it is, is actually pretty good. It kind of increases the violence or it ups the notch in comparison to what happens in The Devil's Experiment in a way, just because there's more dismembering. It's more like the complete destruction of, a, uh, of the human body, whereas The Devil's Experiment was focusing more on destroying a person's uh, senses, like sound and, and sight and all those kind of things. Uh, this one is more just straight up, you know, butchering a person who's still alive. And so you would think that it would be more extreme or that that would make it harder to watch, but there's actually a lot less human suffering depicted in this one than in the first guinea pig. The thing that makes this kind of material difficult to get through and hard to watch is the slow pace of it and the lingering of it. But beyond that, I mean, the, the way I choose to, to view what happens in this movie is basically a woman gets sedated and gets a high and an ecstasy from some drugs that were injected into her, and then she dies peacefully. You know, I'm choosing to view it that way for my own sanity as well, but you could say that that is effectively what happens in Flower and Flesh and Blood. And that's not very disturbing, is it? Because what's, what's really disturbing is the sheer amount of pain and suffering that is depicted in these kinds of movies, and there's really not a lot of suffering in this one, it's just the butchering of a person. Uh, so it's very different. I will say it is still very disgusting and something like this is potentially more likely to make you throw up than something like Salo. So, you know, if Salo was tough, this is gonna be tough as well. You can definitely feel that it was directed by a different person. I don't know what kind of person you have to be to make material like this in the first place, but Flower of Flesh and Blood is nowhere near as effective or as strong as The Devil's Experiment. It's definitely more gory than the first one, but it's also a lot less disturbing than the first one. I hate both of these movies. I hate them more than I hate Martyrs, because they are more empty and, and pointless. Do you guys know that feeling where you have a bunch of things in your mind that you want to say about something, and then as soon as you press the record button, you just don't want to say anything at all? It just completely disappears? and you just feel nothing inside. That's kind of how I feel about this movie right now. Yo, it turns out it's not just the Japanese who can do disgusting extremism stuff. The Germans can do it too. Yeah, necrophilia, fun for the whole family. And by that I mean, please tell me no one under the age of 18 ever saw this film because, oh my goodness, I saw a comment that said, the worst part of this movie wasn't anything to do with the corpse, but rather the atrocious way that steak got cooked. <laughs> hey, Chef Ramsay would not approve. It's true. Listen, I don't know if, I, if it's sad or if it's motivating that a literal rotting, festering corpse is getting more action than I am these days. I'm not kidding either, the love scenes are very, very passionate. I'm not talking about them just transporting a dead body to their bed and then lying next to it. I mean, they really get in there. Oddly enough, that's also the problem that the main character has, which is that his girlfriend ends up preferring dead bodies to him. So that's uh, very amusing. You know, jokes aside, this is a really, really dark little film. It feels very... Ed Gein inspired with all the trophies and the body part stuff in, in the guy's apartment. 
some of the acting and the effects, it, it does occasionally get so bad that you can't help but just laugh, uh, which is a good thing, because it makes it easier to get through the film without major problems. What I don't like about the film is that there is a cute rabbit that gets killed and skinned and butchered, and that is, you know, on display. I've talked about, you know, animals with these films uh, many times, so I'm not gonna go into it other than I feel like the rabbit should have gotten killed much, much quicker. It seemed like a very slow kill. I mean, I don't know how to kill a rabbit properly, but it, it definitely took time, so I did not enjoy that. Other than that, it has one of the funniest endings ever. The guy actually starts jacking off to his own suicide attempt. This is Editor Jay with a little bit of an interruption here. Uh, I just realized how completely insane that statement is without further elaboration. So I would like to add that I don't think suicide is funny and that's not what I'm saying. But what I'm trying to say is that this film and especially the ending in particular is so funny that it will make you laugh about suicide. I hope that clears things up a little bit. Hopefully I'm not just digging my own grave here. <laughs> no pun intended. The ending is also just very well written and in general it is the best ending to a film out of the uh, movies I've seen during this challenge so far. Anyway, back to the original recording. Definitely a dark film. I feel like the times when this film is the most effective is during the nighttime scenes. Because it has daytime scenes, but the nighttime scenes are just so much more atmospheric to me. But yeah, I don't know why I'm analyzing a, a, a film like this. It doesn't make any sense. It's not like I would recommend it to anyone. I mean, at least with this one, you can't complain about it being a Trojan horse because it is exactly what it says on the tin, so... I guess that makes it better than most uh, products you can get at the supermarket then, huh? <laughs> okay, I take that back. I've been debating in my mind back and forth about whether I should watch this film or skip it for the entire time that I've been doing this challenge. So for a very long time, I've thought about it, and... At this point, when you think about something so much, you kind of can't get around it, or it feels like I can't really skip it. For one, I'm a very stubborn person, and when I set out to do something, chances are I'm going to follow through on it, with everything that that includes. But I always reserve my right to respect the dead in everything that I do, no matter what I do. And before even watching it, I already know that this film is going to be pretty disrespectful to the deceased and their loved ones. So that's why I've been thinking about skipping it. But the more you think about something, even if you choose to skip it, which I did eventually do, the more you keep thinking about it. So it feels impossible for me at this point to not watch it. I feel like the only way I'm going to get peace mentally is by getting it over with. So that's probably what I'm gonna do, even though, even now I know that I'm going to regret this, but it keeps bothering me, so I think it has to be done. If nothing else, for this video and for the challenge itself, at least I'll be watching it knowing that I'm not committing a crime or doing anything actually illegal, but ethically I think this film should not exist. Ah, <sighs> fuck those motherfuckers. God help my accursed soul. Well, predictably, I'm mad at the fact that this damn thing exists much more so than I am disturbed or shook by the content of the film itself. If you're going to make generic rape torture porn flick number 5679, Using the most upsetting case of juvenile crime in recorded human history as your backdrop for that is probably the wrong choice. What a fucking disrespectful film. On a more film technical and analytical level, there are things that can be said about this uh, abomination, but none of that matters because the fact is, it shouldn't exist. 
Look, there's going to be psychos out there who think that it's uh, a fun idea to watch this because they like the idea of rape and they think that sounds fun. And if you're one of those people, well, first of all, you're a fucking loser and fuck you. But secondly, well, how do I put this? The stuff that actually happens in the film is a tiny, tiny fraction of what was actually done to this poor girl. So if that's what you're looking for, you're not even going to get that. And as for the rest of us, boys, we skip this one. Just trust me. The final thing I'll say, and I'm not going to talk for much longer about this bullshit, is that the actual real-life case is substantially worse and infinitely more disturbing and difficult than the film. And that is my conclusion from this. I think we can all collectively say rest in peace, Junko, and uh, in case there's any curiosity out there about whether it portrays the victim in any sympathetic light whatsoever, uh, I'll just have you know that this tells the story of the perpetrators, not the story of the victim. So if anything, it sympathizes with, well, those people. And um, they're out there still. Somewhere in Japan, those motherfuckers are still alive and kicking. Well, if there is a hell, they're definitely going there, and that's all I'm gonna say about this. If you'll have me excused, I now have to go pray to the heavens and the hells that the universe may forgive me for having borne witness to this absolutely disgusting bag of shit. I'm uh, recording this immediately after watching the film because, well, I was going to go outside and take a walk, but I want to get this over with because I honestly don't want to think about this film any more or any longer than I absolutely have to. So I guess I'll go into what we're talking about here. We got some, we got a lot of mutilation, but it's, it's mutilation of an already dead body. Uh, basically, the way the film works is you got the basement sequences, which is all the messed up stuff, and then you got it kind of interspliced with more real-life sequences that are just, like, out in, in the rest of society, if you will. And it's all found footage. It's very, very low, kind of, you know, super bad quality VHF, uh, VHS kind of taping uh, material, which makes it feel very real and very realistic, and that is the most effective part of the film, is just how real it feels. Uh, when it comes to the actual basement sequences, we got a lot of psychological torture and a lot of bullying, uh, which I guess I can mention more specifically, we also have a sequence where a person is forced to, like, eat almost eat or like at least have in their mouth a, a cut off toe from a dead body of a person that the victim knew. I think it's supposed to be maybe her boyfriend or something and they killed him and, and they're like cutting him to pieces and feeding it to her or whatever. It's really, really nasty. It is. And it might make you throw up. It didn't make me throw up, but it is a very disgusting film. There's also some stuff with some feces and uh, it's not awesome. It's very much not awesome. We also have what I call on-the-road killings, where the sort of main character, who's just a completely insane murderer, a serial killer, basically, picks people up on the road and kills them, or he murders people in a store, or, you know, just, like, around, just outside, you know? So we got that, too, and then the basement stuff. Now, <laughs> there's some stuff that works about this film, and then there's some stuff that doesn't. It is a very, very tough and disgusting film, and I guess I'll just say it, unless you are a bit of a psycho yourself, you're not gonna get away from this one unaffected, uh, because it's very rough, and it's a very raw kind of film. That's the, the reason why it's so nasty, is because it looks so raw and so real. Uh, when you watch it, or when I, you're not gonna watch it, when I saw it, I, I immediately understood within the first five minutes why people started calling the police or th why it's been theorized that this is an actual real snuff film. It isn't, but it certainly it feels like it is. The cameraman is uh, is 
you know, the part of the duo of these two killers that just walk around and do whatever they want, basically. And then there's the guy in front of the camera, who I believe is also the director of the film. So he's directing, he also wrote it, and uh, is the main character in it. And he's really good at playing a very, very nasty person that that it's impossible not to hate and dislike him. And I guess that's one of the strength, uh, uh, strengths of this one, is that it doesn't glorify serial killers. It just portrays a, a, an example of a fictional, very, very nasty and disgusting one. And you absolutely hate him with every fiber in your body when you watch this. And then there's the cameraman who's like his his pal. He has that kind of super annoying, I almost want to call it frat boy, psycho bullying laugh, you know, down to a T. He sounds really annoying and he laughs a lot in in the film. He has that laugh that like, you can tell that he or his character would laugh at a group rape or something like that. You know, it's that kind of laugh, which is really nasty. I will say, though, to be, you know, to when, when describing what's actually in here, it's not torture that is in the film, it's psychological torture. And what I mean by that more specifically is that the sequences in the basement always show the aftermath of something that already happened off screen. Which basically what it really shows is that this is an extremely, extremely cheap, low budget production. And when you read the story behind it, it makes perfect sense because the director who also stars in it and who also wrote it made it because he wanted it to finance a bigger film, which was the original film that he wanted to make. His real intention was he wanted to make a big and ambitious uh, movie about a zombie outbreak, but he didn't have the money for it. So he made this instead. And he was basically hoping that it would catch popularity for being extreme and finance the thing that he actually wanted to make and you can feel that because it is very extreme and it is made to feel like an illegal piece of video material uh, but it's extremely cheap i will say there's a lot of nudity in here as well and the nudity does at times it it pivots into softcore porn so there is there's actually what i would call pornographic material here and there's also a decent amount of metal music uh, the sound design of this film is that the sound is just whatever is in the room at any given time, which is because it's supposed to feel realistic. But there are certain sequences where they are in places where they have metal music running. That and the softcore porn stuff, it just, you know, and the intersplicing of the real life sequences. I don't know, it just feels a little too try hard for me. And of course, you know, you can ask, hey, what's the what's the problem with trying? What's wrong with trying? Well, what I mean is th there's nothing wrong with trying if it works and it does work, but a thing is not scary or disturbing because you put nudity and metal in it. That's not how that works. <laughs> That's not how my brain works, at least. That's not the way to, to the terror in me. Uh, you have to go through other ways. Look, this is a tough one, but at the end of the day, I've seen Guinea Pig by now, and it's not that level. So I can see and understand why the people who have gone through August Underground would hail it as the most disturbing film ever made. I can for sure see it. I think it's one of those films where if you don't know what you're getting into, it's going to be unexpectedly sick and depraved because it is a very, very sadistic film with a naturalistic approach. And it ends up giving you that raw, super, super depressing nihilistic feel, which, I mean, you can praise it for that if you want, but I guess that just depends on what you want out of a film. Obviously, this is not for me, and I don't think it's for a lot of people. <laughs> I'm grateful that there's not a lot of physical torture uh, depicted as like happening on screen here because that's the stuff that gets to me so I'm salvaged by the the insanely low budget of the film because you can tell that he the director wanted to show as much as he could <laughs> with regards to depicting a completely sadistic serial killer he wanted to show as much as he could but he didn't have the budget to show physical torture in action and I'm glad that is, because it meant that I could get through this one. 
and still keep my sanity, at least for now, although I can feel it slipping at this point. I have to admit, with all these films, you know, I'm not saying it's affecting me, like, big time, but it's starting to stack up, and I'm having second thoughts, but uh, that's a different discussion. Tough one. Horrible, horrible thing to to watch, to witness. Absolutely horrible. But I have seen worse. Well, that was probably one of the most boring things I've ever forced myself to sit through. You know, coming directly off August Underground, this really was surprisingly tame. But there is a lot of dismembering and gore, just, you know, for your information. I could describe in detail what the scenes of violence and puke are in this film, but I'm not going to because uh, I, I feel like that would be a waste of time, because the film is a waste of time, if you want to call it a film. This is boring as fuck. I kept checking the time constantly until I was so bored and checked out, I legit started browsing unrelated things on the internet. It's very disgusting, and there is a lot of gore, and there is, you know, because of the bulimic nature of a lot of the things that happen, it might make you throw up if you watch it, I guess, but if so, then it's not going to make you throw up because it's disturbing or, like, it's mentally getting to you. It's just, like, that would exclusively be, you know, a reaction to someone else doing that very same thing on screen. So it is very gross, but... If there's supposed to be something particularly disturbing or scary about it, I'm sorry, I don't really see it. It tries to be very satanic and edgy, but it fails in that, in my opinion. The editing is insanely bad. It's visual noise. It looks like ass. It sounds like ass. Probably the worst sound design I've ever experienced in, a, in any kind of video material at all. It's so fucking annoying to sit through. I don't know who the hell edited this thing and thought it needed this many cuts. Like, the amount of cuts, and it's visually very annoying. It's it's fucking 70 minutes long. I don't think I've ever seen anything this boring. I'm actually considering skipping the other two in the trilogy, not out of being disturbed, but just because... I'm thinking about going straight to Snuff 102 and Philosophy of a Knife, because this is a waste of my fucking time. I don't think there's, there's anything particularly scary about it, it's just really disgusting, and I think it's just the fact that the film exists in the way that it does that makes it scary, because it's not a satire, so it its existence implies that there are people out there who actually get off to bulimic prostitutes being pretend tortured in a non-film, so... Uh, the film itself is not scary, it's just gross and a bit unnerving, but also kind of hilariously shit. I don't really see any kind of a deeper meaning, other than the metaphor of the fact that the film itself is a bigger pile of shit than all the piles of puke in the film. I must say, though, it is a very exploitative and predatory uh, thing that, that seems to be going on here. Uh, it's definitely made in that way where it feels like some bad things were probably going on behind the scenes. And if you do a little bit of research, then you pretty quickly find out that uh, apparently the actress was, you know, supposedly, I mean, we don't know this for a fact, but an actually bulimic underground hardcore porn actress, which, you know, she was allegedly trying to get clean off drugs, and then uh, Mr. Valentine promised her that and exploited her and did not help her at all. So if that's true, then that's messed up, and that is severely more messed up than the actual material itself. So I guess you can take that for what you will. All right. As opposed to a lot of the other stuff in this tier, this film actually has a kind of a plot or a story that it's trying to tell. So for that reason, I'm going to try and give it something resembling a real review. So Snuff 102 is about three women. You have one who is pregnant and addicted to drugs. And then you have one who I think was supposed to be a pornography actress who is desperate to 
pay her rent and she'll do any kind of job for money. And then the third one is a journalist who is researching snuff film and depravity and eventually finds herself over-involved, I think you could say. So the main character of the film is definitely the journalist who is trying to investigate the subject. She is interested in kind of like the idea of snuff and extreme film and the philosophy and this reason behind why they exist if they do exist and she's trying to figure these things out only for her to eventually get kidnapped herself. Basically, you just have these three women who are put in a situation and having several acts committed to them. The film does try to have some social and cultural commentary on the online world and on film in general and exploitation and things like this. There's quite a lot of dialogue in the film about it and it tries to ask some interesting questions and while the plot does sound interesting on paper, when I actually watch it, it's not really that interesting. I mean, at least they're trying to talk about it while depicting it at the same time, which is kind of like a meta-narrative, I guess, but it's, you know, I mean, they have some thought-provoking questions here and there, but it's nothing mind-blowing, and they certainly don't have any real answers in this film, in my opinion, to any of those questions. Uh, whether that's about the nature of snuff, or the, entertain the entertainment industry in general, it serves mostly as padding or as break from all the torture scenes, as far as I'm concerned. I guess you could call it pretentious. I don't think it's that pretentious. I think, you know, the film doesn't have a lot to say about it, but at least, at least it's trying to ask some kind of question, which is a lot more than a lot of the other tier 4 stuff. And it also has characters in it, which is a surprise. <laughs> the way the film works is that it has segments that are broken up where you have the snuff sequences themselves. They're not actually snuff, so I, should, I shouldn't call them that, because it is fiction, obviously. But it has the, all the torture sequences, which are quite slow and painful, and have there's a lot of gore in it, and it is quite nasty. And then that is interchanged with flashback sequences that are in black and white, so you know when it's a flashback. And basically, it just goes like a week back in time to show each for each of the women what led up, the events that led up to the position that they now find themselves in. As for the visuals of the film itself, it does have that amateur feel where it's quite gritty and the recording is low quality. Uh, you can debate whether that's a budget or a stylistic choice, but it is the kind of choice that August Underground also made. I think the soundtrack is a little annoying because it has some dub beats or like heavy bass beats that it keeps using as a... It's supposed to simulate your heart beating very desperately, or the victim's heart's beating very desperately, I think, which creates a feeling of intensity, sure, but it does get a little annoying, and the actual sound design and the soundtrack has a lot of... I want to call it screaming in it that is... It's not really scary, it's just... It gets kind of annoying in the long run. Overall, I think the film looks okay, and I think it sounds okay. A bit on the amateurish side, but I've seen worse. Granted, that's pretty much only the case because I've seen Lucifer Valentine stuff, to be fair. And August Underground. I'm probably gonna have to give it to this film just for the amount of disturbing material that it is still able to show. It's shown in darkness. There's a lot of black and a lot of red in the film for obvious reasons. <laughs> There's also some sexual torture in it. The gore is, in my opinion, quite extreme and a little tough to watch. It's not a film that gets my heart pumping, but it, it is disgusting. It does disgust me. So it contains some very gruesome sequences. That's kind of like my attempt to talk a little bit objectively about what the movie is and what it has in it. Uh, as for my own takes on it, Snuff 102 is very obviously not a snuff film, despite what the intro title card says. The way the film starts is that it has a little text card, you know, that some, some films have that thing where they say, ooh, based on true whatever stuff, right? And this one says, like, the torture depicted in this film are real events or something like that. 
um, which is obviously wrong. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's wrong. It's false, right? It's factually incorrect, but it's it has that title card there, which I think is just there to scare people who would believe things easily, but... I don't know if you guys have ever seen a film called Fargo from 1996, I believe. Uh, I think it's the one that's directed by the Coen brothers, if memory serves. But anyway, Fargo is a masterpiece, but the reason I'm bringing it up is because in the beginning of Fargo, they show one of those cards where it says, um, based on, not based on real events, the blah 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 depicted in this film uh, actually happened and are true events or whatever, right? Uh, and that's also completely false. Fargo is fiction, and the stuff that happens in it is very, very loosely based on narratives of different stories told by people from different contexts and then put together in a new story. So there's nothing real about Fargo, even with what it says in the beginning. The reason I'm bringing that up is because the Coen brothers didn't do that to try and be manipulative assholes and to make people believe that something was more real than it was, that this is my interpretation. I think they did that to show that you should be critical of the media that you consume and that you can't just believe whatever a film says at the beginning of it. And that's exactly how I feel about Snuff 102 in that it says something, and it tries to be something, and it tries to depict snuff, and it really isn't. Uh, and thank God for that, because the fact that snuff even exists, assuming that it does, I hate that. I hate the thought of it, I hate the idea of it. This is obviously fictional, so it's kind of fine. The other thing that I want to say is that some of the screaming sounds from the sound design in this film sound like the zombie, uh, the zombie screams from Half-Life 2. I don't know if you guys ever played Half-Life 2, but those, the zombie guys that have crabs instead of a head, they make that sound. <laughs> yeah, you hear that a lot in this film, and it's really odd. I don't know why. I think I was 30 minutes into the film before something actually happened that really got nasty and, like, got to me. But the film is an hour and 40 minutes long, so there's still plenty of time for the rest of it for nasty things to happen. And they do. As for the gore stuff, we're talking about things happening to the face, uh, the mouth, fingers, um, also the eye, and a person's teeth. So, yeah. Very nasty. It's a bunch of low-quality and gritty footage presented in a way that is quite chaotic and frantic. It's definitely a difficult watch. I mean, it's a challenging film <laughs> for sure. Not necessarily in a good way though. Uh, so, you know, it probably would have been better as a short film, I guess, but I don't know if I really care about that because Conventionally, I would give a film like this probably a 2 or a 3 out of 10 because it deserves the points for the effort and for the story and for the characters. But none of that matters because Snuff 102 has real animal cruelty and animal death in it, which immediately knocks it completely down to a 0 out of 10 film for me. I have said this before, I have zero tolerance for that shit. Get it out of my fucking films. I don't want to watch it. I don't want to look at it. So you can analyze this film all you want, but the fact is, there's real animal stuff in it, and that's just not okay. As for the disturbing factor, I think in my mind, this one is somewhere between a Serbian film and August Underground. Like I said, it's really difficult to get through, but actually... I don't know if I'm just getting hardened by all this material, but it's kind of not that bad. I mean, make no mistake, I'm not gonna have good dreams tonight, and it is a pretty awful film. <laughs> I've looked around in the communities a little bit to try and see what people's takes are on this one, just because it tries to have some social commentary about it, and what I'm finding is that there's a lot of Argentinians that are kind of apologizing for the fact that the film is from their country. <laughs> Guys, it's okay. It's it's fine. You don't need to apologize because it's an Argentinian film. It's fine. In comparison to normal films, this is extremely intense and extremely brutal, and it deserves to be in this category. 
Obviously, the plot and the story that I keep referring to is very minimal, so make no mistake, it, this is still exactly the kind of film that you think it is. So let's not give it too much credit. I think that some people would find a Serbian film to be tougher and harder and worse to get through, but for me, I think this one is, is kind of like a notch up from that, like a step up. Uh, you gotta have some strong eyes, you gotta have a strong stomach, otherwise you're not gonna get through this one. Not that you guys are gonna watch it, I certainly hope not, but I'm not gonna spoil it, I'm just gonna say, I kinda liked the ending. Not that I understand these types of movies at all, I definitely don't, and I don't see the appeal, but I'm getting through them, I'm watching through them now, so I may as well appreciate what I can appreciate, and I gotta say, I didn't hate the ending. But I'm not gonna forgive them for murdering that pig and torturing that monkey. Those are just sequences that I don't need in my life. Just because you're abusing or doing harm to animals and not people doesn't mean it's okay. And I will always stand by that statement. The last thing I want to say about it is that if my memory's correct, I think Wendigoon had some comments about how it can be tough to find uh, subtitles for this one. Uh, I think I forgot to mention it, but it is an Argentinian film. I'm not going to get into how I find these things, but it was not really that hard, so you can if you want to, I guess. I mean, I'll go so far as to say I did have to use DuckDuckGo to get to this one. Uh, Google was, for some reason, not having it. I don't know why, <laughs> but uh, there you go. If there's anything story-wise to discuss, I guess it would be the question that the main character is trying to ask, which is... Does snuff really exist? And if it does, then why? I don't think the film answers that question because the film itself is fictional, obviously, uh, and that's a good thing. <laughs> but, I mean, I can answer that question without watching any films. It exists somewhere, probably. I mean, it's probably out there. People do nasty things to other people. Well, some people do. Was this a tough watch? Absolutely. Maybe it'll get your heart rate up, but it's not going to get your heart rate up more than talking to a bothersome neighbor. <laughs> well, clearly this was written and directed by not only a complete amateur who sucks at making film, but worse than that, someone who was clearly not taught in school when to kill your darlings when you write an essay or a report, because this is so long and it's so fucking boring. I sat through... Two hours and ten minutes of uh, an old Russian guy talking about nothing. I mean, I must be the only guy on planet fucking Earth who actually sat through this one without going straight up comatose. It's just an old Russian guy sitting in a chair talking and talking and talking about whatever little village he came from and whatever he studied after middle school and that one time him and his mom went to pick mushrooms in the forest. I don't really care about it. <laughs> oh, and then there's, of course, you know, torture porn sprinkled in here and there, but this is only part one, so the whole thing put together is apparently a whopping four and a half hours of complete boredom. Which, by the way, I will not be wasting my time with part two, because number one, I have a life, and number two, I gotta move on to Melancholy Der Engel while I still have my patience for this challenge. It's funny because I had a similar existential ambivalence about whether I should actually sit down and watch this like I did with the Junko film, Juvenile Crime, because it does depict some things that actually happen to real people and, you know, respect for the dead and all that stuff, but I did it anyway, and I gotta say, I'm not mad at Philosophy of a Knife because it tries to depict the insane and inhumane things that happened in that crime against humanity that is known as Unit 731. I'm mad because it did such a shitty job. I mean, if I was the ghost of a real Unit 731 victim, I would have at least wanted someone with a bigger budget and, you know, real competence to show my suffering. But I guess that's exactly the thing, isn't it? Probably not a lot of people with actual brain cells would sit down and spend their energy making a project like this. By the way, I don't recommend watching the most popular YouTube videos on the unit either, because, at least from what I could find, those videos are really shit, and they spend most of their time discussing the context and the war and the politics surrounding 
the issue and explaining the unit's existence. It's like nobody on YouTube has the balls to actually really talk about what the fuck happened here. Which might be a monetary thing, to be honest, but basically what I'm saying is, uh, don't waste your time with this one, but also probably don't waste your time on YouTube with this stuff. So if you want to know about it, I recommend reading about it instead. And it does make for some disturbing reading, I'll tell you that. Unit 731 was no joke. So my experience with this film, uh, if you want to call it a film, 20 minutes in, I got up and out of my chair and I just went for a jog outside because I was so fucking bored. Then I came back and I pressed play again and I was so bored for so long that I started reading about Unit 731 on the internet as the film was running. Because what the fuck else am I going to do? Stare into nothingness for two hours? Come on. Oh, and when I was done with that, I pulled out a book and I just started reading my book while the the thing was running in the background. So, I guess this is the type of, of film that makes you productive. I mean, I was seriously considering busting out my vacuum cleaner and just vacuuming my living room as well now that I'm at it. That's probably what I would be doing if I put on part two, to be honest. If anybody cares about an actual review, uh, the torture porn itself and the practical effects, it's all very poorly done here. Um, the visuals are terrible, the sound design is terrible, the editing is also shit, so if you care about that, it's just a bad film all around. And also one thing I did notice, I was like an hour and ten minutes into the film before the real nastiness actually begun. It's a scene with the teeth getting pulled, by the way, and it was quite nasty and really bad. But beyond that, there's nothing to see here, really. And also, for some reason, there's only Russian victims in this uh, film, which is kind of weird. It's pretty biased, and I might speculate a little racist, because there are a lot of Asians in the production, so it's not like the person didn't have the budget or for some reason couldn't gain access to Asian actors and actresses, but all of the victims that are tortured here are played by Russian actors and actresses. It just doesn't make any sense because all of the Asians are playing the perpetrators, but what actually happened, if you know anything about the unit, then you know that we're talking like 10 to 12,000 Chinese civilians that were tortured. Uh, not Russians, so what the fuck? I mean, I'm not Chinese, but if I was, I would be deeply offended by this shit. In terms of how difficult it is to get through this and how disturbing it was, have you guys ever tried, like, a a really tough spicy food challenge, but then halfway through the challenge you realize that you're not going to be able to win and you're not going to be able to finish, but not because it's too spicy, just because there's so much fucking food. Yeah, that's exactly how I would describe philosophy of a knife. It's really not that hard to get through, but it's hard because it's so fucking boring and it's insanely long. I mean, four and a half hours? What were they thinking? Also, why is it specifically focusing on the pornographic violence against, you know, hot Russian blondes rather than the many Chinese people who were the actual victims? Look, if I want to look at the labia of a hot Russian, I'll just go to Pornhub, thank you very much. I don't know what kind of reaction the maker of this thing wanted or was expecting, but I guess the first 10 minutes were okay because during the first 10 minutes, the film is not quite as shit, and you still have the patience to actually, you know, care about it before you check out mentally. Ah, <sighs> I would imagine most people who actually tried to do what I just did probably gave up at some point. It's just excruciatingly boring and super amateurish. Also, the sound effects, the sound design, and the soundtrack overall is really irritating, it's just fucking annoying. It's very similar to that, like, how annoying the Lucifer Valentine stuff is. Well, at least I read a couple chapters in the book that I'm reading at the moment, so... There's that. Oh, and uh, there's a rape scene in here too, so... I guess in that way you could call it a banger! <laughs> I'm not apologizing. There is no joke I could make that would ever be as bad as this film. Oh, the teeth pulling scene really takes the smile off your face. <laughs> uh, fuck you. Well, that was a challenging ASMR video. <laughs>
Okay, melancholy der Engel. The story is uh, pretty simple. You have two two old friends who meet again, and they gather a group of people back in an old house where they've done things before a long time ago, and then uh, some disastrous uh, events happen. Doesn't that sound like a recipe for fun? See, I think the setup and the premise for this film is substantially more interesting than the execution. Sadly, this is another very long, very boring one. It's honestly a lot like watching Philosophy of a Knife again. This thing is a whopping 2 hours and 38 minutes. I don't understand why you would make it like that. You're, this is not the Lord of the Rings that you are making. This is completely degenerate material. There's no reason for it to be longer than 40 minutes, to be honest. An hour and a half max. It shouldn't even be that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna describe what's in it, but keep in mind that when I describe the actual contents of what happens, it sounds a lot worse than it is, because when you look at the contents of this film, it sounds like it should be the most disturbing film of all time. So we have some nudity. We unfortunately have animal cruelty and death, including the butchering of a pig and also a rabbit. And that stuff was real, which instantly makes the film a 0 out of 10 for me, obviously. I do not tolerate that shit, but it's in there. And um, apparently all these films that um, want to be edgy and difficult to watch and uh, very disturbing. They think that it's uh, fitting to have animal cruelty in it. Uh, in them, I should say. And I couldn't disagree more. It completely takes me out of the film, and it just makes me hate the filmmaker more so than being actually disturbed or scared in any sense. Uh, surprisingly, the film also has real sex in it, which I did not expect. And I say that because there is at least one clip in the film, at least one, where I could tell that um, this is not faked. It's actual real pornographic material that exists and is part of the film. So not just nudity. And that surprised me. Not that I'm foreign to uh, porn whatsoever. That would be disingenuous to say. But I just didn't expect that. Like, I didn't think that that was part of this tier of film, but whatever, it's in there, so fuck it. We also have some torture and some rape and some necrophilia for good measure. I think the tougher, toughest parts of this film is actually just the disgusting body fluids that it keeps depicting, namely puke piss and a little bit of feces. That's very disgusting, but beyond that, there's not much to really be rattled by in this one. There is one sequence which I will mention, which is, well, how do I describe that? Vaginal violation, but with a knife. Yeah. That's nastier in theory. I mean, the idea and the thought of it is, is incredibly disturbing and fucking disgusting. But it's much nastier, nastier in, in my mind than the depiction in the film is. And... That sounds weird, but the reason I say that is because the violence in this one is just in general very poorly made. And honestly, my brain isn't buying it for a second while I'm watching it. Uh, I hate the fact that this film wastes my time depicting and panning over rotten animals and insects that are disgusting instead of being an actually skillfully made or scary film. I don't think this was particularly disturbing at all. I came into this with some expectations that it was going to be a tough watch. It wasn't really, it was just a watch where I wasn't eating while I was watching it, but that was all it did to me. Uh, this is some regular ass bullshit, in, in a sense, you know? I feel like this was kind of like the German hippie version of trying to make a super exploitative extremism film. Or maybe not hippie, maybe I should say goth and emo like German goth and emo, because there is some of that. I mean, obviously this movie fits the category, don't get me wrong, this is not a normal movie. <laughs> it is super exploitative and it is disgusting. It's just not scary. So, disgusting as fuck for sure, but ultimately very slow, very long, and tame and boring. I think this is what you get when you have a pretty pretentious filmmaker who 
wants to be kind of like an artist, but is trying to also be edgy and break every single taboo off the list and just like sitting there with a checklist. Yep, we've done this. Yep, we've done this. Yeah, we've done this. But all the violence and, and a lot of the depravity in the film is not even on screen, really. Like, it's kind of like half on screen and then it pans away and shows something else. And it's like, if you go into this expecting a regular movie, then this is going to be way, way, way too much. But if you come into this film with the expectations that I have, then it just feels fucking retarded. Wait, are you allowed to say that word these days? Anyway, that's what it's like. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just being honest. It's too bad as well, you know. I really felt like I was building up some excitement for this one. Like, I was genuinely scared to watch this film because I, like, had imagined in my mind that it was the story of two old guys. You know, two old friends finding each other at the tail end of their lives and just saying, fuck it, we're both gonna die soon. Let's do some depraved shit. And I thought that that was going to be what this film was. And instead, it that's not what it was. It was two kind of like middle-aged men who are just friends. This was less scary than a lot of tier one films. There are regular ass horror films out there that are just well-made horror that will have you much more in suspense and will leave you much more perplexed and disturbed than uh, this one will, in my opinion. I mean, you could even leave the horror genre and you would still find things that are, that are way more difficult to get through than this type of a film, although for different reasons. This is somewhere between Pink Flamingos and Necromantic for me. And it leans more towards Pink Flamingos, I think, unfortunately. In fact, I shouldn't say that because this film actually has way better camera work than Pink Flamingos, and also, mm, yeah, the content of this one is not quite as harmless. I think the worst stuff that happened in Pink Flamingos was basically murder, so yeah, it is a little different after all, so I take that back, but... Actually, come to think of it, the best comparison is uh, is to Suicide Club here. I can't believe I didn't think of that until now, but actually it's pretty obvious because that it's that Japanese film, Suicide Club, is this film has the exact same uh, issues, you know? I mean, there's real cinematography here, and there are some technical aspects that are relatively well done, kind of, and then there are also some technical faults, but... The real thing that is a problem here is that the film tries to be philosophical and fails. It's like the film thinks that it needs to try to say something profound while depicting things that are, uh, shall we just say, not particularly empathetic. <laughs> uh, so it fails really hard, it falls completely flat in my opinion in that aspect. Which is also the reason why its runtime is an issue, because you can have a film that is really long and, and boring, and it still isn't quite as boring after all, if it has something existential to say. But this really kind of doesn't, in my opinion. Well, it sort of does, because there are points in the film where it's trying to tell you and even quite explicitly through the dialogue of the characters, is actually telling you that you are not your actions. And so the message of the film, the way I see it, is that you can do evil things without being an evil person. Basically, what's actually happening here is that the message of the film is trying to justify the torture and sexual abuse and murder that happens in the film, which is kind of hard to be a fan of because... Yeah. The idea that you are not your actions and therefore you can do evil things, but that doesn't mean that you're not suffering and that doesn't make you evil, is a load of shit when it's this bad. So I don't think anyone with brain cells are actually buying it. This really was just incredibly suspenseless and boring. Anyway, I'm repeating myself. Let's move on. Life and Death of a Porno Gang, very interesting. Uh, similarly to Cannibal Holocaust, I actually find myself quite interested in the plot and the characters and the meta-commentary that comes with the film. So, 
because there's actually a real plot with real characters in this one, I'm going to uh, break it down for you guys. Now, I know that Wendigoon does that in his video, but I'd like to give my description as well. So you have a main character named Marco, who is a 30-year-old Serbian man. Yes, this is a Serbian film. Not a Serbian film, but it is a Serbian film. Uh, not to be confused with the movie in Tier 3, I think it is. He is coming fresh out of film school in Serbia, and he wants to be a director for a feature film. And uh, his style is not very impressive, and he can't really get the funding to bankroll his movie. He doesn't take that very well, and in the story, he ends up coming to terms with the fact that he's going to need to be a porn director. So he bands together with a bunch of worn-out porn actors and actresses, and they basically head to the Serbian countryside, and they entertain village folk and the local farmers with some porn-themed theater in front of them, like live theater, you know, on a stage, but it's not actually a stage because they're just out in the country, so, you know, just on the ground. And at that point, they end up attracting the attention of a shady, shady man who is willing to give them the money they desperately need in return for some more authentic depravity. And so they get drawn into filming snuff, and that's what the story is about. Now, it's pretty brutal, but it's also not the not the hardest to get through. In terms of what we have in the film, there is nudity, obviously, and depiction of porn, so that's going to be part of it. There's also drug use. We see various uh, body fluids throughout the film. We also have a scene with a trans woman pleasuring a horse. No, I'm not kidding. That's in here. And then we also have self-harm, a lot of cutting, and multiple suicides. And when I say cutting, I'm referring to the self-harm of cutting. The core of the most disturbing stuff in the film is the several snuff movies shot by the main character, Marco. Uh, one that sticks out is the chainsawing of a tree where he's filming somebody chain with a chainsaw cutting down a tree and a guy's head at the same time. The guy is tied to the tree and he cuts them both and then yells timber and it's really funny but also pretty insane. So there's some creative stuff in here. It's pretty interesting to a degree. I mean, I'm not going to call it a masterpiece or anything, but I'm going to say for a tier 4 film, this is probably... In terms of the quality and the characters and the story that's actually being told here, this is this is the best tier 4 film. I still have one left to watch. I think it's called Where the Dead Go to Die. I'm not expecting that to be revolutionary. So I think it's pretty safe to say that this film is just straight up the best of the tier 4 films. Not the most disturbing, but definitely the best one. The quality of the visuals is not the highest because it is filmed in that grainy way where it's a little bit, you know, pixelated or, or it just looks older than it is. I mean, this thing is from 2009. They could have shot this with some higher quality cameras if they wanted to. I mean, unless they didn't have the budget, I guess. I think that in 2009, it shouldn't be insanely expensive to get some half-decent cameras to shoot with, but whatever, what do I know? I, I think the point here is that there's actual real commentary here. Uh, which is surprising for a Tier 4 film, because I haven't seen any of the other Tier 4 films having this much of a story to it, except for the very first one that I saw, which was uh, Viva la Muerte. So, that's interesting. It is pretty... You have to be able to stomach some nasty fucking things to, to see this one, there's no doubt about that. Overall, I'm just very positively surprised by how good and poignant this actually is, because it turns out that this is a very real exploration of the human consciousness. There's no point in this film where it tries to excuse the existence of snuff films. It just shows it to you and then goes, here's a bunch of characters that you're kind of sort of getting attached to and getting to know, and now you're going to watch 
what happens to them mentally, psychologically, when they are put in a position where they they have to witness and do some bad things to other people. And the group, you know, it's called a gang, the life and death of a gang, and they are a group. They're traveling as a group. They look like a bunch of hippies, and it's fantastic because they're laughing together, they're crying together, they do drugs together, and then eventually, it, when it really comes down to it, you can see that once you are about an hour into this film, and it does have a slow start, but about an hour into this film, it starts it starts getting difficult, and that's where it mentally is affecting the characters. Uh, there's also an entire scene where the whole gang gets straight up raped by the group of local farmers who just hunt them down with rifles and handguns, and then at gunpoint, it's a forced group rape, and it's completely insane. I mean, I've never seen a, a, a scene in a film like it, and it's executed authentically enough that you can kind of believe it when you're watching it. Like, it, it's actually done in a pretty serious way, and it's treated pretty seriously and poignantly, and I think that's a good thing. The group starts to mentally fall apart more and more the further into it they get. The drug use gets out of control. They have reactions to what they are doing themselves. That's a layer of authenticity and character expor exploration that I did not expect in this one. So I'll give it credit for that. I mean, what a ride. I almost can't believe I'm saying this, but this was kind of a piece of art. If you can handle it. And if you know what you're getting into. I mean, I wouldn't recommend any of the tier 4 films, but if I had to pick one of them, my recommendation would be this. I mean, the film is quite good, to be honest. Even though it is a very slow starting one, at least it's honest. I think the monastery scene was quite powerful, actually. At some point, the gang comes across a monastery, and the leader of the gang, who is the main character, Marco, he um, speaks to a priest or a monk, uh, whatever it is. That kind of spiritual aspect becomes a part of the psychology of the film and its characters as well. And it's funny because one of the porn actors actually ends up saying that he's going to stay at the monastery. And throughout the film, he has seemed like the least intelligent, lowest IQ guy, but he's very charming and very fun. So it's not like you dislike his character for being not the most intelligent guy in the room, but he actually makes the wisest decision in the entire film when he decides to leave the group and say goodbye to his friends and hugs them all. And, and he says, I'm going to stay at the monastery. This is where I'm going to be at now. And I mean, that was the best decision anyone ever made in this film. I could have done with a little less sex and pornography and drug use and body fluid depiction. I don't prefer those things in a film. It could have stuck more strictly to the snuff depiction, which is the more mind-bending, challenging stuff that this story was about to begin with, in my opinion. If I had to pull out a more sharp criticism and, and be a little more negative, uh, I would say there is some acting that is not the best you've ever seen, and there are technical aspects of it that actually don't work very well, but I don't think I would criticize such an obscure and insane film at the same level that you would normally criticize a regular film, you know? This isn't something that you go to the theater and watch. This is something you watch in secrecy and shame, at home, alone. <laughs> but it's definitely, definitely not the most shameful thing to watch on this, on this tier list at all. I actually can't believe I'm saying this about a tier 4 film, but this was genuinely just worth watching, straight up. And I gotta say, between a Serbian film and now this, I don't know that much about Balkan history, but Serbia as a nation, you guys, I don't know what you've gone through, but what the fuck. I hope you guys get better. You are a hardcore bunch. Did I mention that this film has suicides? 
like a lot of them. Anyway, I guess if you ever needed something to deter you off your porn addiction for a while, then you can do a lot worse than this. There is one animal killing in it, but I don't know if that was practical effects or they actually did it. So I'm not sure how to feel about it, but I'm not going to research that. Not now. I've seen some people online saying that this is very similar to a Serbian film, but I would go so far as to say this is not, not a case of if you've seen a Serbian film, then you've seen this. I actually think there are quite different films, and I like this one better. The last thing I would like to say about the life and death of a porno gang is that the guy who is playing the gay man with the mustache and the leather jacket is unbelievably good. He's so good. I haven't seen acting like that since Joaquin Phoenix and Joker, to be honest. Not all of the acting in this film is amazing, but that guy, he was fun. He was really fun. <sighs> It's tough. It's tough when you feel like there are many things that can be said about it, and yet it's hard not to be speechless. Um, so, the description from Wendigoon, you know, this is an animated film, and the animation is very jank. Uh, the sound design, I can say, is also relatively bad and pretty jank. I mean, it's okay, I guess. You know, it, it, he's correct. It does look like a Gary's mod animation gone wrong. And there is that part of your brain that kind of looks at that and laughs and goes, haha, funny movement. You know, it looks jank, it looks weird. That's funny. But once your brain kind of just accepts that the animation looks like shit, and it sounds the way that it sounds. Uh, the actual gravity of the story that you're witnessing does eventually sink in. And it's not good. It's a very bad time. The summary for this one is you have a troubled group of children growing up in the same environment, on the same block, I guess, and are haunted by a talking demonic dog named Labby, who is trying to um, deliver the word of God. <laughs> and by that I mean bringing them on some surreal hell rides and that is the summary of the film that the internet will give to you. That's what the internet is going to tell you. I'm going to give you a different one. Uh, what this actually is, is an animated depiction of production of child pornography. Including all the child sexual abuse and torture that um, you would imagine. Or hopefully not imagine. <laughs> it even includes... A little tough for me to say this, but... Child-on-child -child sexual abuse is also in here. It's hard to describe in words what this film is. My impression from searching around, as I do is that this movie is more obscure than the other ones in Tier 4. I couldn't find a whole lot of reactions from people, even just, you know, written reactions on the whatever communities I could find. Most of it is just people already being turned off by, the, by just the gore that it has and the disturbing animation that it has, and then they just quit, like, halfway through because they can't handle it. And that is completely understandable. That is 100% understandable. Even disregarding what I just told you, 
This film is already a very, very bad acid trip. It's just very uncanny, extremely dark. It really is like some sort of a drug-induced fucking fever dream just gone completely off the rails. And then you sprinkle in depictions of, of what I mentioned earlier and it's like probably the highest level of morbidity in terms of the contents of the film that is in the in 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 this tier i thought midori was bad i thought that was a tough animation to get through this is just uh, fucking heretical <laughs> and i'm not religious in terms of the quality of it, I can't really say much. Depending on your expectations and what you think you're getting into, you could experience this as just being complete shit and a 0 out of 10 in quality, or you could... Actually, I can see someone kind of loving it and thinking that it's great. I don't really care. I don't care. I don't give a shit. Probably the craziest part of this whole thing is that it's actually a real story that's being told. It has real characters and real plot points, and even a twist or two, which might surprise the viewer. I certainly was surprised myself by at least one of them. And, you know, decisions are made in this one. Obviously, the premise is that the demonic dog is manipulating the children into doing nasty and wrong things. But the true source of evil in this film, in this story, is not the kids. And it's not even the dog. It's what the adults do to the kids. And that's why this thing is so fucking nasty, because that hits a little closer to reality than I would like. And that's a crazy, crazy thing, because the film itself is visually completely surreal. It doesn't feel realistic at all, and yet it feels way too realistic. I don't know how that's possible, but it's not a good time. That's all I can say. When a child murdering his parents is somehow the tamest thing in the whole, in the whole film, you know things have gone completely fucked. I guess one of the reasons why it ends up feeling a bit too too real is because the film goes out of its way to portray the psychological torture of of growing up in a home or an environment like that where um, child pornography is being produced and you are the star in it. It 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 really really goes into the psychological damage and how soul-destroying it is and what the experience of that kind of torture is for the child. And that's... Um, it's just very, very rough. Horror is subjective, and I'm sure some hardcore motherfuckers would watch this and just write it off as a bunch of dog shit because of how poorly it's done on a technical level. And if that's how you feel about it, then more power to you, I guess. But as far as I'm concerned, this is a, a, a very obscure film out of the tier four ones. And I'm going to go out on a limb and say that's a very good thing. Well, I guess that was tier four. What a complete nightmare. I almost don't know how to sum up how I feel right now. I mean... What am I supposed to say about this? It's just... It's so much morbidity and darkness. I should have quit a hot minute ago. I'm not gonna lie. This is... This is going really bad. <laughs> for me. <laughs> you know, I thought Tier 3 was, was bad as it was. Genuinely. Uh, and it is. But my god. These films were exactly what I feared. My dread coming into this was clearly warranted because I got fucking blasted by this shit. It's crazy because you want to say that it's like, oh, it was that movie that cracked me. It was that movie that broke me. But it's just the overall amount, the sheer amount of insanity 
there's just so much of it and it takes so long. I mean, for me, obviously, because I'm doing this where I'm, I'm sitting through all of it. If I wasn't doing this challenge, if I wasn't coming at this from a place of having decided to begin with that I'm going to follow through on all of this, I would have stopped probably at guinea pig, to be honest. That is the one, if there is one of these film films that sticks out to me, it is the first guinea pig. That one did kind of crack me open worse than any of the other films. Turns out I had very much not seen guinea pig in advance, so mystery solved. I did discover, however, which film it was that I confused it for that I have actually seen. It was a 1999 Japanese film called Audition. That was the one I had seen already. Which, by the way, if you're curious, I don't remember anything about Audition other than the fact that I had a tough time getting through it. <laughs> so, um, if you want a recommendation, I guess you can watch Audition from 1999. I'm not sure how to prepare you for it because uh, I don't re remember very much about it. But you should know that it's probably not going to be the easiest to watch. Just a heads up. And then after that, it was kind of like the accumulated... I don't even know what to call it because I haven't felt anything that uh, feels the same way. <laughs> uh, I don't know what to call it. It's just a very bad time. So yeah, I uh, if I was only doing this for my sort of natural, initial, morbid curiosity, I would have quit a guinea pig, and I should have, for my own mental health, if nothing else. But I guess I'm just very stubborn. Apparently to a fault, case in point. My god, I should have quit. Whatever. We're here now. It is what it is. Staring down the barrel of a tear that is allegedly even worse. Can't say that I'm looking forward to it. I guess my conclusion for now is that the not safe for life tag, starting with tier 4, was very warranted, in my opinion. Obviously there's nothing to recommend here. I think most people uh, shouldn't even watch 10 minutes of any of these films. I mean, obviously, depending on which one you choose and which 10 minutes you choose, you can nuance that statement quite a bit, but realistically, just don't fucking watch it. Stay the fuck away from these films. That is my recommendation. That's it. I think more than a handful of times so far, I have considered just completely quitting and not returning to, to this more than a handful of times. And right now, this is this is one of those times because it's not gonna get any better. Obviously, I won't be diving into anything that is, you know, non-fictional material. Well, I don't know if that's obvious. Maybe I'll talk more about that when I'm done with this challenge, but tier six and, and, and beyond is just, and I knew this from the beginning of the challenge, that was never gonna be part of the challenge. I was never gonna touch any of that stuff. I was gonna sit down and watch you know, the extreme and, and insane stuff, but only the fictional stuff with no real things, no real, you know, and and that way I'm also staying on the correct side of the law, I think, I hope. I mean, I might be on a watch list at this point, I don't know, but uh, yeah. My reaction to this right now is that I don't know how to react, because it's just a fucking nightmare, and it's not over. So let's have some fun. <laughs> As for the description I can give you guys of Tier 5, other than what Wendigoon states in his video, it's basically just Tier 4 taken to the next level. Supposedly, there is no enjoyment, absolutely no enjoyment to any of these films, other than just morbid curiosity, period. And it's definitely a similar philosophy to the Tier 4 stuff. It is literally just cinematic material made to be as disgusting and shocking as possible. That's what it's made for. That's it, that's tier 5. Even just saying that now, I... Wow. I really don't want to do this. I can feel it. I can feel that I've gone too far already. For my own, uh... Liking, but... Well, you guys can tell from the length of this video whether I, uh... <laughs> I do it or not. You guys know better than I do right now. Assuming there's anyone watching? Probably not. Which would probably be a good thing, but... It is what it is. I find myself saying that a lot nowadays, going through this. That sentence, it is what it is, I seem to be saying that quite a bit. Hmm. I wonder why that is. 
starting off um, as softly as possible, because I knew that I needed this badly, we have the Necrophiles. Yeah, this thing was always going to be the easiest one from Tier 5 to watch, and I'm glad it is. I'm glad it's here, because, um, yeah, I think... I needed this uh, break, so thank you, nice guy Phil, for stalling a little bit for me and salvaging my sanity, at least a bit. This is this is more of a um, certified hood classic kind of a film than it is actually scary. My words are escaping me right now. I don't know why, but I can say that this thing is pretty funny. It's definitely the so bad it's good situation. This is so B-roll that it's fucking C and D-roll as well. It's exactly the kind of cheesy horror stuff that you made with your friends when you were 15 or whatever. That's that's what this is. It's basically more comedy than it is horror. It doesn't take itself seriously, which is why the funniness of it actually works. I mean, if this film tried to take itself seriously, it would have been pretty awkward. The acting is terrible, the effects are terrible, the story is just hilarious. I'm pretty sure this was put in here just to give anybody researching this stuff, let alone watching it, which is what I'm doing, a bit of a break. Because, I mean, it has the spook factor, sure, but it has the spook factor that you get from <laughs> whatever this is. It's not a tough watch. I mean, it does have things like real nudity in it, and depictions of murder, disembowelment, attempted cannibalism, rape, but all of the stuff that is technically in the film is much more frightening in concept than it is in execution. Suffice it to say that this is the greatest horror film of all time, and I will not tolerate any slander. Absolutely banging iconic, <laughs> disgusting filth. Stanley Kubrick has nothing on this, you guys. There's gotta be some way we can stop this thing, man. Oh, Satan, I can feel you coming. <laughs> well, it's still better dialogue than Avatar The Way of Water, so there's that. So I'm not buying that on Blu-ray, that's for sure. <laughs> Eccentric Psycho Cinema Volume 1. Apparently, there's seven of these things. My goodness. So the community reactions that I could find were people either seem to think that it's a bit tame and uh, very boring and slow, or the other type of reaction uh, that I saw is that they completely despise it and are absolutely disgusted by this, and they think that you're a, a, a complete red flag if you enjoy this stuff and they're pissed off that it was even recommended to them. Uh, so there's, uh, basically there are the people who are, 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 are like traumatized by this, and then there's the rest of us. <laughs> uh, as you can probably tell, I lean a bit more, personally I, I lean a bit more towards the, it's just a very slow, pretty boring thing to watch, and not really that tough for me. The thing about it is that this was really hard to find. I could not find any version of this that uh, has subtitles in it, and it is in Japanese. My Japanese is not very good. In fact, I don't speak Japanese, and I don't understand it either. I have a respectable amount of anime under my belt, but never with the intention to learn Japanese. So, you know, I understand when she says onegai and uh, yamete, and he says oishi, uh, and that's kind of the level that I'm at. But that's mostly okay for this film, because that's also mostly the level that the film is at. So, I don't think I miss much. The concept seems to be pretty simple as well. I mean, you're just asking, what's the grossest thing we can do to a woman, and then put it on camera? Sadly, they fail that concept pretty hard, in my opinion. I get why it's categorized to be in here, but it's not a difficult watch other than the fact that I didn't understand uh, a lot of what they were saying. <laughs> but, I mean, that just makes it boring, not difficult in terms of the reason why we're here. 
It starts out in black and white and then it becomes in color. It looks like a really old, broken, shitty videotape. That's just what it looks like. It's a super bad recording. I think the whole thing was probably just recorded in a single handheld camera. That's certainly what it looks like. And it has kind of like the occasional frames of basically frames disappearing and the audio just lacking or cutting out a bit. So the overall product is super, super low quality. It's like 480p resolution or something. I think this one was mostly just super, super slow and not a lot of stuff happening. It looks really fake when he hits her. You can see that his hand doesn't actually connect to her face, that it's visible on camera, that there's no connection. There's also no sound. The thing that this film does have is a fair amount of nudity. The whole concept is that uh, apparently a bank teller woman has been kidnapped by uh, a psycho guy who's, uh, who's gonna uh, violate her and kill her. There's not that much violation and uh, that's a good thing because the sexual stuff that happens is actually real. That's not practical effects. Uh, that is real, you know, touching. So there's a fair amount of nudity and there is um, manipulation of the erogenous zones. I think I can phrase it that way. Uh, and, and I get that that was like a thing in 1998, but... Today, you can just go on Pornhub and search for the bondage section, and you're halfway there, to be honest. The only thing that really makes it different is that this is simulated rape. Wait, do they have that on Pornhub? I don't think they do. I think that's illegal, right? You're not allowed to simulate non-consensual stuff and have that on uh, the big sites. I think, I think that's illegal. I, I'm not sure. But uh, anyway, that's that's really the only difference. And then, of course, the ending, which is a bit disgusting. It pisses me off a little bit that the IMDb description is wrong. So I'm just going to read it for you. It says, After having tortured and sexually assaulted bank teller Noriko, psychotic vulvectomizer Takeshi removes and bottles her vulva as a souvenir. Uh, that last part is correct. But the word that triggers me a little bit is psychotic. Okay, it doesn't trigger me, but I'm just going to correct it. Th that's not what the word psychotic means. Uh, obviously, they're referring to him being a psychopath and kidnapping and killing women. Uh, psychosis is something else. So, just wanted to correct that. This movie is so obscure, though, that I wouldn't expect the person who has written the IMDb summary to be someone who works in psychiatrics. So, I'll forgive it. But it's the thing about, I mean, sexually assaulted can be, that can be multiple things. And uh, there's no penetration. So, I mean, yes, it's, it's, I don't, I don't know what to fucking call it. Nothing happens. It's, it's just a bunch of fiddling around with, a, with bondage stuff for an hour and, and, 20 minutes and then the last five minutes of it he that's when the nasty stuff happens and it's not really that bad what else do we have there is one point in the story where she gets the knife back and tries to escape she actually stabs him uh, at least i think that's what the movie's trying to show i think it's i believe it's trying to show that she stabs him and it has a sound effect for it she somehow fails to kill him and fails to escape and fails to stay in control of the situation. So that was just kind of hilarious, but he just sort of gets up and then walks up the stairs and she gives up and falls down on the ground. So, yeah. Uh, bank teller Noriko is not a fighter, you guys. <laughs> she is not a fighter. She gives up real quick. Also, I will say the sound effects for stabbing are just hilarious. They have that old 90s anime sound effect for, like, stabbing, which is completely odd and doesn't sound real at all. There are descriptions that say that these are kind of, like, extremely graphic, most disturbing of all time, sick-as-hell films. 
and all I can say is, as far as this first one goes, I'm probably going to forget it in like a day. If we're coming into this from the point of view of having been told that this is some of the most violent and gruesome and shocking stuff that exists, then we're definitely very far from that description and expectation, in my opinion. It's just fiddling and nudity. Of course, because it's Japanese, the very dangerous genitals are obviously blurred. And not that I give a shit. Of course, he kills her in the end. The most disturbing part, really, is that he's cutting off her vagina with a knife while she's still alive. But the special effects are non-existent, so... I don't know, it just doesn't feel real enough to be disturbing for me. I think if something like this wants to hit hard, then the acting needs to be better, uh, the script needs to be not written on a fucking napkin somewhere, or the effects need to be way better. And also, more stuff needs to happen. I mean, I don't blame the actress for the poor performance. It's a shit role to be given to begin with, so I just hope she caught a paycheck. Of course, it's not a detriment to a film that it is slow, especially if it is supposed to be a torture porn film, just because the slow torture is actually more difficult to get through than the quick violence, which is why Guinea Pig was so tough for me. But that's not what I'm talking about with this one. It's just a slow film period. I think this fits the term exploitation more than anything else, though. I mean, if you just remove all the blood, it's basically just softcore porn. Go do some research on the uh, American toy box killers, and it will be an infinitely, infinitely more disturbing version of this. I might check out more in this series if I can find them. I can't guarantee that, though, because it's super slow, it's really boring, we all know how it ends, and I don't know if, if it's even realistic. I had a tough enough time getting my uh, my eyes on, on this first one, so we'll see if I can find anything else. And uh, if not, then I really don't think I have missed out. We found volume two, and it is just more of the same, although this time it is apparently a kindergarten teacher who is the victim. Not that you would ever know that from actually watching the film, though, because there's absolutely fucking nothing that indicates anything about the actual characters. Except maybe some of the dialogue, but I couldn't tell you because, uh, like I said with the first one, can't find any subbed versions, and I don't speak Japanese, so there's probably a very, very, very small amount of so-called storytelling that I'm missing in that regard, but I guess the maker didn't get the memo of show, don't tell, because both of these films are filmed in the same basement, and only in that basement, so there's nothing with regards to the victim's character or history or job that is actually depicted in the film, as far as I'm concerned. Like I said, other than maybe dialogue which is a worthless way to depict something. Don't ever use dialogue to depict something important in a film. You should always show it instead. But I guess you can't expect people who make things like this to understand the basics of cinema, right? That would be insane to have those expectations. So instead, I'm just gonna say, we found it. I can't find the other five in the seven. Allegedly, there's seven of these. I can't find anything else. I found the second one, it's more of the same shit, I have nothing new to report, and honestly, I'm bored out of my mind, and I can't find anything else anyway, so we're moving on. Also, we have now reached the point of obscurity where the website that I use to track the movies that I watch actually can't find this stuff. It could find volume one, and by that I mean I can find it in their database. Volume 1 is apparently in their database, which is impressive, to be honest, but Volume 2 isn't, so yeah, I can no longer track what I'm watching the way that I usually do it. 
it's a minor detail, but it just goes to show how difficult it is to get your hands on things that are this weird and obscure. He violates her with a bottle of wine, I guess, but like with the rest of the violence, it's not particularly convincing, so it's kind of a joke, to be honest. But I guess it's something for creativity, maybe? I don't know. All right, that was The Taming of Rebecca, and... Surprisingly, it's an actual porn uh, film. That's what it is. So th that's on the iceberg, I guess. Um, it has a scene with some nipple piercing, which is... I guess that's supposed to be the disturbing part. It's not really a disturbing or scary film. It's really just vintage porn with the Halloween soundtrack used in it. You could literally search for this on like Pornhub or wherever else, just find some vintage stuff and just find the Halloween soundtrack on uh, YouTube or whatever, wherever else and just put on the soundtrack and watch whatever you find and now you pretty much have the taming of Rebecca. You know, except for that nipple thing, I guess. I think this is really just porn that had some dedication in terms of what they were willing to do in it. And that's how I would describe it. I mean, it just seems like a standard rough, uh, you know, rough, some rough stuff from back in the day. And uh, that's all it is to me. So that was a pretty easy, although boring watch. Mm, I mean, it's, it's porn. <laughs> I think, you know, I'm watching it now because it's on the iceberg. I'm obviously preparing myself for the worst for every single one of these entries when I put it on and watch it. So from that point of view, this was nothing. It was actually nothing. I would say if, if you are attracted to watching this because of the iceberg uh, and you're expecting something really nasty, then yeah, you'll be disappointed, I guess. I'm not sure if I was disappointed because I'm not out to like ruin my mental state any more than what's necessary to get through this damn iceberg. But with that being said, yeah, um, this was definitely not difficult or nasty. It was just, um, it was just a thing. You know, maybe back in 1982, this was the stuff that like serial killers and rapists watched. I don't know, but as far as I'm concerned, Easy. Easy game. The Germans taking another stab at it with Östermontag. This film starts out with three content warnings, which is just... <laughs> it's so funny. Well, it actually has four, but the fourth one is just, you know, a fictional weird introduction to the movie. But it, it actually starts with a mental health warning to put your feet up and listen to relaxing music if you start to feel bad. And then it says, remember, it's just a movie. Then it gives you a second warning after that, where it says that it contains extreme violence, not suitable for minors under the age of 18. And when you're done laughing at that, it gives you a third warning where it says, snuff cut caution warning, Children, pregnant women, and mentally unstable people might suffer severe emotional trauma from watching this movie. That is so funny. I mean, credit to him. If you want to scare people about your film, it definitely sets the tone, right? So, <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen that before. So yeah, it sets the tone, and then there's, of course, like I said, there's that fourth weird warning, which is just a bunch of fictional bullshit about the tape being found and potentially used to solve the case of a missing woman or whatever. It's just, you know, whatever nonsense you start your thing off with if you want it to, I don't know, be extra scary for the people who are very gullible. And... What can I say about it? It's a standard serial killer flick, except it's very poorly done, and the content is a little less standard. I mean, it goes pretty far with some of what it actually has in it. 
to its credit, what the film depicts is like mega disturbing, but the way that it does so is not. I mean, the atmosphere is definitely creepy for some of it, but it is pretty funny and not in a way that works. Like, for example, at the beginning of the film, there's a point where the maniac is grinding his knife on a sharpening steel. And it just looks it just looks hilarious to me because he's so insanely bad at it. Like I'm 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 literally looking at this guy and he's supposed to be an intimidating murderer in a film and I'm just thinking clearly this man's never worked in a kitchen cuz he is dog shit at it. I mean he does not know how to sharpen a knife at all. <laughs> not only that, but he also sh- just like, shouts and grunts like a complete wimp when he kicks his victim and, like, pushes her around. And it's just like, oh, man. The casting, I mean, I'm never gonna complain about people not knowing how to handle a knife, but maybe don't cast that guy who doesn't know how to handle a knife and doesn't know how to be intimidating as your serial murdering maniac in a horror film. Maybe cast someone else. And that's the problem this film has in general, is that it fails because everything feels so fake. The acting is fake, the sound design is fake, the visuals, the special effects. It all just looks kind of god-awful, it all feels like shit. So, I mean, fuck comparing it to horror movies, I think Fatal Attraction is more disturbing than this stuff. Like I said, the, it's it has some disturbing things in it, like there's dismemberment and a ton of blood in it, so there's that. But, I mean, come on. Dude, what's with Tier 5 just being extremely easy to watch? Don't get me wrong, I was grateful for the necrophiles giving me a break from all the actually disturbing stuff, but at this point I'm kind of like, is this entire tier just a break from the difficult to watch stuff? Because... As far as I'm concerned, this is kind of a fucking joke. I will say the post credit scene for this one is by far the nastiest uh, stuff in the whole movie. There's also necrophilia in it, so Germany and necrophilia, it's just a thing, I guess. I'm actually a little bit bored with this tier so far. I feel like it's not pushing my limits at all. I mean, famous last words, right? But... Seriously, I, I'm kind of hoping for something that's a little bit tougher than this, because I'm actually just bored. I guess it's just crazy to me that we went from guinea pig and where the dead go to die to whatever the fuck this is. Maybe what I'm slowly learning is that this iceberg is not a disturbing movie iceberg, it is a obscurity movie iceberg, and we're just getting into the more and more obscure stuff rather than the actually disturbing stuff. At least that's kind of what it feels like to me. I mean, you know that a movie has failed to be a true horror movie when the first thing I think of is that Fatal Attraction is tougher than it. I mean, that can't be a good sign. You've done something very ineffective and sloppy, if that's the case, I feel. I guess that's how I would describe this entire tier so far. Just ineffective and sloppy. Well, that was just downright grotesque. I'll tell you the plot of this one because, surprisingly enough, there kind of is one. So the story just follows a couple of uh, pornography actors. They have been recruited by a director and uh, they're gonna shoot a film. So they go to a remote location and it's going to, you know, start out as a regular uh, film and then eventually there's going to be some more hardcore stuff. And the actress, whose name is Kana in the movie, that's the character's name, uh, Kana is told that, you know, it's going to get rough and um, once they start, it's too late to stop. And she kind of just agrees to the job and assumes that she can handle it. And she assumes very wrong, because by the time they get to the S&M stuff, she starts expressing some discomfort (laughs) and some reluctance. 
So basically they start off with just vanilla stuff and then they move on to flogging and some other things. And Kana reveals that she actually has zero experience with this stuff and she wants out, which is kind of to the growing frustration of the director. So when they decide to call it and give up because the actress doesn't want to proceed, Kana tries to leave. They say, yeah, go ahead, you can leave. And then they knock her out and tie her to a bed. And then the real stuff begins. Now, the thing about this film is it's not really until you're halfway through the film that you really start getting a sense that consent has left the building. So it's definitely a slow start, but when it does begin, it does get pretty nasty with the mutilation. I'm not going to go into detail about every single thing they do to her, but it does include a scene with her tongue and also, well, <clears throat> an opening of the torso and the execution of necrophilia through that opening. So <clears throat> whatever images you're getting in your mind right now, I think that's about right. I am not sure how to feel about this one. To be completely honest, it's definitely the toughest one out of the uh, tier 5 stuff so far, so there's no doubt about that. The tongue scene was incredibly nasty, but at the same time also kind of visibly fake. Which, I mean, thank god for that, because it is kind of the fakeness of some of the effects that ends up uh, salvaging your sanity. Some of the violence does look extremely fake, but the sex looks like it's actually real. And that's just because the effects are at times a bit amateur, but even with that being the case, they still have some pretty impressive effects in here. It's a bit boring for a while, but if you can get over how boring the film is for most of its runtime, and you just focus on what it achieves, it actually uses its its one hour and nine minute runtime surprisingly well, in my opinion, in terms of build up and slowly just making you more and more uncomfortable. So in that sense, I guess it's not the technically worst film I've ever seen. I mean, you gotta love how they keep censoring the genitals because it's a Japanese film, but they don't censor anything else. So the insane and disgusting violence that happens and the torture that, that does eventually happen is just completely on display, but you can't show that JJ. No, no, no. That's illegal. That's just Japan in a nutshell. So, yeah, obviously genitals are completely overly pixelated in this one, which doesn't help the film feel more disturbing or difficult to watch. It actually just makes it kind of hilarious, which is a bit sad because... This one had potential. It had potential to be really, really, really nasty and difficult to get through. But it's actually not the worst thing in the world. Shockingly, I am actually seeing a lot of people in the communities discussing this film coming over from TikTok and questioning whether this stuff is real. And all I can really say to that is just put the fries in the fucking bag, you idiot. <sighs> These people need to go back to TikTok where they came from. What the fuck? Of course it's not real. I would say overall, this is a pretty filthy film. You are saved by some of the less convincing effects in here, for sure. But it is, in terms of the actual contents of it, probably one of the most offensive and just straight up disgusting things I've ever seen. So I can at least give it that much credit. I mean, it's not exactly a piece of art, but if that's what you think you're getting into here, then your disappointment is your own fault. I think in terms of just analytically and objectively looking at this film, I would probably agree with the sentiment that it is one of the nastiest movies ever made. I mean, in my head I would agree with it, I'm just not really feeling it. I felt it to a degree, but I'm not sitting here shaking, throwing up. So I guess it depends on your expectations, but it is definitely hardcore. So there's for sure a risk that you might get nauseous from this one. I mean, it's not tame and it's not family friendly. <laughs>
So I guess it achieved something, maybe. I think that if all of the effects were as good as some of the best effects in this film, then this could have been top tier nastiness. But yeah, it's not. I mean, unless pixelated genitals are just the absolute bane of your existence, I think you're gonna be fine. Okay, back at it again. The story this time is that a woman is abandoned by her husband, and she is coping with the emotions of that through some violence that she is doing to herself. She starts off with a toothbrush, which she decides to use in a sexual way and kind of a violent way to deal with her tensions, so to speak. And eventually she swaps over to a knife and gets going. She inflicts a lot of pain and uh, self-mutilation, and that's what the movie is about. And by the end, she dies. Surprise, surprise. So that's it. Well, at least it's my interpretation that she dies. I would say the ending scene doesn't make any sense because the knife is no longer in her skull and she opens her eyes. So I guess you're supposed to think that she's alive, but she does put a knife in her own skull, so not sure what the logic is. In fact, the continuous logic in this one is actually a bit of a problem. I mean, I did have to pause it twice while watching it, just because it was so gross. So it's definitely not a comfortable watch. Like, for example, at the beginning, she bites off her finger and it's really, really disgusting. And it's so disgusting that I had to pause it and like take a short break. But that same finger grows back later in the film. So the fuck? And it's the same thing with the knife in the head. It just, I don't know. There's also a scene where she pulls out her own intestines and in a very disgusting way starts like sucking on them and kind of like eating them, which it also kind of takes the realism out of it. I feel like if you did that to yourself in real life, not only would you be screaming, which there is not a sound made from this woman at any point. Uh, so not only that, but you would also probably faint from the pain, right? Or from blood loss, but she isn't. She's just casually sitting there. She actually looks extremely comfortable, which really takes the edge off. There's also some tongue stuff where she cuts out her own tongue, but again, just like with the knife in the skull, uh, the tongue looks like it's grown back in the ending shot, uh, which just means that I don't understand the film. <laughs> I understand what it's trying to do, but I don't understand how you can fail so hard <laughs> with, with regards to just making the things that have happened to the person actually look continuous and permanent. So we got fingers growing back, we got a uh, knife through the head magically disappearing, and uh, the tongue grows back and uh, she's alive at the end. Yeah, I don't think any of that was intentional. I don't think she's meant to be regenerating. I don't think this is female Wolverine. I just think it's a very bad film. But I mean, you guys can uh, feel free to correct me if any of you have ever eaten your own intestines while you were still awake doing it. I will happily stand corrected. I actually think the effects, though, are just generally kind of better than this man's uh, other movie that we watched, which was the Tumbling Doll of Flesh. There was a lot of the stuff in Tumbling that looked very silly, and this one doesn't look as silly. It's, it's definitely disgusting and does look pretty real, but it is silly and doesn't feel real. The soundtrack is also very funny, and it sounds like an alien taking a shit after a 3x spicy Samyang challenge. So there's that. Guys, uh, this one is only 40 minutes long, and so was Guinea Pig, but unlike Guinea Pig, I would actually wager that the people who are hardcore enough and in deep enough, like I am, to find and actually want to watch this thing, we, those of us who go that far, we are probably so hardcore, or at least by now your skin has been toughened, 
to the point where we will just be bored watching this. I would wager that this film has no audience for that reason. I think everyone who actually gets to this film at any point in their life are just going to be bored by it because it's too disgusting and weird to have anything even remotely resembling niche appeal, let alone something like being a half mainstream movie in the horror genre or what have you. But at the same time, it's just barely too tame to not be boring if you're a true, I don't know, gore fiend or whatever people call themselves who try to be edgy. So anyway, what I'm trying to say is it feels like this one doesn't commit to the bit hard enough. Like if you take Guinea Pig or August Underground, I mean, I'm not going to talk these films up like they're good. <laughs> but they commit to the bit. That's the point. I think for this thing to work, it needed to be hyper-realistic. And it isn't. So, yeah, it'll make you squirm, and you're not gonna drink your morning coffee and eat your breakfast while watching this. But it is ultimately a boring watch. I mean, it's just Japan being weird again. In other words, there's nothing to see here. The one thing I do want to mention, though, <clears throat> is that the the file, so the version of it that I found, that I had access to, uh, has the Rare A Dead Person trailer in it, which means uh, the file is longer than 40 minutes. I stopped watching at exactly 41 minutes and 30 seconds to avoid this trailer, because I don't know what the trailer is. And I don't really want to do the research. I've mentioned this multiple times before, but I'll gladly repeat it again. I'm not in it to watch real death or real bodies or corpses or real violence of any kind. I'm never going to, ever. Just out of principle. You know, you, you can call it existential perspective, you can call it spirituality, you can call it respect for the dead. Whatever you want to call it, I'm just not going to. And as soon as I, f I, I found out, because often when I dive into these things, I do just a little bit of poking around in various communities that I can find, just to make sure of what I'm watching. And, <clears throat> and I found out that my version had this in it, and I decided not to watch it. I don't know, like I said, I don't know exactly what it is. I don't know if Rare a Dead Person is a tier 6 movie. I think Wendigoon may have mentioned what it is, but if he did, I have forgotten. It could also be the trailer for Traces of Death. Again, I'm not sure. But I avoided it. And again, because if you're watching the real stuff, it's no longer movies, in my mind. In my mind, you're not watching a movie at that point. You're watching a recording of something that is kind of like... It feels disrespectful or violating to my um, intuition. So, I'm an internet person. I grew up with the internet and with computers, and I think everyone in my generation and younger than me are, are probably able to watch a trailer like that and not be shocked. I mean, I would probably be fine if I did. So I'm not afraid of it in that way. It just, it goes against my principles. And I'm going to stick to those principles. Speaking of internet people, I guess that really sums this one up too, doesn't it? I mean, maybe back in 1999 this was worth something, but if you are an internet person, <laughs> and you also like horror and gore, there's a good shot that this isn't going to do anything to you. At least not too much. You will be mostly fine, I think. But then again, horror is subjective, so you never know. To quote one of my favorite villains from a modern animated film, Jack Horner from Puss in Boots, The Last Wish, that was weird. <laughs> that was weird. I'll give you a quick plot summary, because there is actually a story in this one. Uh, we, it's about a 17-year-old schoolgirl, Misaki, who carries food to a crazy woman who lives under a bridge. 
and the crazy woman is truly that. She has a doll that she thinks is her baby, and she breastfeeds it, which is interesting. Uh, Misaki, the main character, she is uh, she's just a girl, and she has one friend. Her only friend is a classmate who also moonlights as a prostitute. And you also follow a couple of repairmen who just enjoy rape. And one of those two repairmen sets his eyes on Misaki. However, he's trying to redeem himself because he actually doesn't want to, like rape people anymore. He wants to settle down with Misaki and be a good man. He wants to turn his um, less than fortunate tendencies around and he has his eyes on her as the key to this change in his life. He doesn't succeed in that change, by the way. This is Rape Fest the movie. I'm not kidding. Oh, and also, that is just kind of like what it looks like in the first 10-15 minutes. What actually happens is that eventually in the movie, Misaki gets home in the afternoon, and that's where the real misery begins, because she has an older sister who is very heavily scarred from a traffic accident, and their dad just rapes her every day. So there's a lot of sexual violence and some very bizarre scenes in this film. Uh, including the woman under the bridge actually breastfeeding the main character at one point, which is not particularly uh, mind-blowing, but it, it is a little bit disgusting. Oh, and there's also a rich stalking businessman who uh, drinks piss from uh, the main character at, at, one, at one point. This is definitely peak weirdness. It just is. It is, in fact, so weird, it is such an oddball film that I busted out laughing a good handful of times watching it. I just couldn't help but fucking laugh. It was too funny. <laughs> it was just, it's, it's so bizarre that you couldn't, you couldn't come up with this in your imagination. And that, it just takes you off guard and makes you laugh. Even if the subject matter is in theory, nothing to laugh about. The execution kind of is. I will say this is not a particularly scary film, but it is very bleak. The story itself is extremely bleak. I mean, you feel bad for the main character and you feel bad for that sister. You even feel quite bad for that woman who is trying to take care of... Uh, what clearly isn't a, a, a human baby. I guess you could say that, you know, you can be mad about it and say that this movie has no purpose or whatever and shouldn't exist, but honestly, I feel like this is one of those films where you can tell it had a really, really low budget, but that they also did the best with what they had, which I think that process in and of itself is kind of commendable. One last thing I want to mention with regards to the budget is that the effects are actually fairly well done. They're not well done enough for it to be truly terrifying and really kind of get under your skin. It certainly does not achieve that. But again, given the amount of money that they obviously had, it, it's not the worst. It's an effort. But yeah, it's also at the same time a film where you're sitting there, you're thinking, Japan, what? Uh, fucking Japan, for fuck's sake. Like, what? <laughs> Just come on. Ugh. The good part about it is that it's only just over an hour long, so... And it has some interesting things in it, I suppose, you could say, from a certain point of view. So it doesn't overstay its welcome, per se. And I also think that the girl who plays the 17-year-old main character is actually a pretty good actor. I've definitely seen worse acting, so I appreciated it from that sort of more technical point of view. I thought she was good. Other than that, though, mm, not sure. It's more sexual abuse, which at this point I've seen it before, but there is admittedly a lot of it. The thing that broke my heart the most was actually when the repairman who is 
who has fallen for the main character, Misaki, he gives her a letter and basically confesses his interest in her. He gives her a letter and it says, you know, meet me on the bridge after school or whatever it said. And he's standing there waiting for her and she never arrives. And then in, in that frustration, he leaves with his stupid friend and goes on an absolute murder raping tear in the local area to get back at Misaki because she she didn't meet him at the bridge like he invited her to do. And the reason why that's extra tragic is because Misaki was at the bridge but just later in the same day. So there was something about the timing that was misunderstood be between them, which is kind of silly in terms of plot point, but I mean, given the fact that it happens in the story, it is really heartbreaking because you get the sense that if the characters were just a little less unlucky, something else could have happened. But that's just not the kind of movie this is. This is the kind of movie where things are gonna go wrong, and every character is either a psycho asshole or a very, very, very unfortunate soul. There are no good characters in this movie, so to speak, in terms of just being a good human being to your surroundings. Unless you want to count innocence as being good, which I suppose you should. In which case, the main character is... I mean, she's alright. She fails to rescue her sister from their dad being a psycho rapist, but I don't know if I would blame her for that. I mean, she would have had to kill him. I can see why it would be difficult to murder your own dad to stop him from raping your sister all day every day. But I can also see why it wouldn't be, so I don't know. Tough call, but yeah, domestic abuse, incest, it's all in there. America is back at it again with the definitive satanic cult movie of this tier, I guess. This film has a lot of graphic stuff in it. It's very gore heavy. There is also self-mutilation, drug and alcohol use, general nudity and graphic uh, sexual sequences in it. And because it's very, very American and very obvious in its, in its uh, themes, it has a lot of religious, political weirdness in it. I don't know what that means. I don't know if there's supposed to be some kind of a point to that. Probably not too much. Now, in all, I don't think I have too much to say about this uh, this thing. The visuals are quite scary because the gore is very extreme. We're talking, it's another one of those ones with just tons of blood in it. A lot of dead bodies. There are just, there are so many dead bodies in this one dismembered body parts all over the place, a lot of murdering, but I also have to say a lot of what happens in it is mutilation of corpses more so than active torture, which makes it much, much easier for someone like me to watch because for me, the stuff that scares me and disturbs me the most is just sheer physical agony. But if what you're mutilating is already dead, then you're not applying pain to anything. So it's a bit easier for me to watch for that reason. But it is admit admittedly a lot of blood in this one, regardless of, of how you view it. There is a scene, actually, and it's going to be a, a little bit graphic, but I'm going to describe it because it sticks out, where they cut a man's throat, and he dies from it because he bleeds out. But then they push his tongue down and into it and pull the tongue out of the throat slit, which while that is not funny, <laughs> in my opinion, it is at least creative gore, I guess. So I think that deserves a shout. I mean, I certainly wouldn't have thought of it myself. It's a little bit out there. <laughs> Beyond that, I mean, the sound design has some scary music in it, so they try and get to you with that. I think the acting is pretty terrible in this one, but the dialogue is also really dumb, so it's not like they were given Shakespeare to work with. In all, I don't know if it's just because I'm a little bit desensitized to this stuff at this point, but I can honestly say that I'm kind of fine. I'm mostly fine with it. It was not that bad to me. And as with 
most of these films. Luckily, it's only like an hour and five minutes long. So it doesn't waste too much of my time, which I always appreciate. As for the actual quality of the film itself, is if anyone cares, I don't imagine anyone does, but if you do, it's shit. That's all I have to say about it. Also, funny thing, uh, this movie has one of those, what are we, some kind of a suicide squad <laughs> moment where the main character just says, uh, he says something like, oh, don't worry about it, it's just the gateway meat or whatever, it's so dumb. <laughs> Gotta love it when movies have that, right? Amazing. Wow, okay. <laughs> okay. Wow. Oh, fucking hell. Good lord. Good lord, that... That gets me. That gets me. That's, uh, wow, that's a lot. That's quite a lot for me. Holy Jesus. I'm fucking exhausted after that. Uh, words coming to mind. That was fucking repulsive. <laughs> I came into to this one... Obviously, I'm, I'm watching this immediately off the back of, of uh, the Gateway meet and, and the one before that. I've watched all three of these films in the same day. And I was coming into this last one kind of with that same expectation of if you really want to be scared, you're probably better off just watching stuff like Audition or Ichi the Killer again. Uh, because everything in this tier has kind of been very amateur. Like, it's been a little too amateur to be truly upsetting and difficult to watch, at least for me. And this is, you know, the last film in, in the category. And I was thinking, okay, let's just get it over with uh, before my day is over. And it still has the same commonality with everything else in this tier in that the effects are kind of so-so. But I think the effects in this one are good enough, they're strong enough, that it'll get your heart rate up. And this film is fucking disgusting. It has probably the grossest thing I've ever seen done with a fork on film, which immediately puts it in the higher echelons of disgusting. And the screams that are done by the actresses are actually pretty well done, in my opinion, which also, obviously, that gets to me. This is pretty torture-heavy stuff. And I think that's also why it becomes kind of painful for me, is that when it becomes very torture-focused, that's, that's what becomes difficult for me. There's just a lot of pain here, right? From what I can see in the communities, pretty much everyone is just regretting that they saw it. <laughs> Everybody is just going, why? Why did I surrender to my curiosity? And, uh, yeah, I'm definitely feeling that right now. I mean, I've been feeling that with this entire challenge, to be honest with you, so that's nothing new for me, but, yep, this is, this is some pretty crazy violence, in my opinion. Pretty, pretty, yes, the production is really cheap, like I said, but the torture scenes is still, it's still disgusting enough, it's still well enough done, and just the, the sheer contents of what actually goes down in, in this story, if you want to call it that, is pretty fucking insane. So, yeah, this one will get to you. That's, that seems to be the consensus, and I'm gonna join that consensus. But, if this is what you're looking for, then you got it, you know? I mean, <laughs> it definitely delivers on the nastiness. That being said, though, I did, just now, right before recording, also check out the manga. I haven't actually read the entire manga, but I've read I've read a, a, a chunk of it just now. And I gotta say, you know, not to be that person, but the manga is even nastier. And if that's what you're in it for, then you really gotta check out the source material over the movie. You know, this is My Chan's Daily Life, the movie. And it's really disgusting for my money, 
but even this film is not quite as cracked as the manga, so if you are looking for that 10 out of 10 disturbedness insanity, then yeah, it's it's on the pages, so to speak. Uh, and in case you're curious, I'm not going to tell you the story of the film or, or the manga, but I will tell you the concept, which is very simple. Just somebody made a manga where basically imagine that you have a maid and your maid is immortal. She can never die, she regenerates every injury, and you can do whatever you want with her. And then it's that kind of age-old, semi-psychopathic, philosophical question of if XYZ, what would you do to that person? Which, if you're a normal human being, the answer to that is you would take her fishing, and if she's wife material, you would wife it up. But of course, the people who make this stuff don't think that way, because that wouldn't explore anything extreme, would it? Which means it wouldn't be interesting. So in reality, when you actually look at the manga for My Chan's Daily Life, it's not people who go fishing and romance each other. It's more like, um, tie you up and penetrate you with a bunch of nasty objects and then I'll burn you alive. And other more sexual torture stuff that is even more uncivilized, which I will not describe to you, but I've seen it. It's really in your face and it's right there and it's super fucked up. So yeah, that's a manga for you. I think if I was to sit down and go through the manga from start to finish, I would rate that as a piece of media on a 10 out of 10 disturbedness insane scale because it it crosses certain boundaries inside of you when you read that when you read those pages and you see that art and those drawings, there's something in you that gets crossed that doesn't want to be crossed and that's uh, that's how I feel about it. As for the movie itself, I mean, it's not quite 10 out of 10 craziness, but it's definitely, it's punching up there. Because I'm standing here recording this right now, I'm, ju I'm just feeling like, yikes, you know, like, fucking hell. That was big yikes. Average day in Japan? Maybe. <laughs> but big yikes for me. Oh, and if you care about the actual quality of the movie, it's just a shitty movie. But everything is a shitty movie at this rate. So that shouldn't be a surprise. Again, I've said this before, but I do feel like the people who approach films like this with the expectation of quality filmmaking are fucking idiots. First of all, that's not what these films are made for, for the most part. Uh, they have an entirely different type of appeal. And secondly, these types of films are amateur, very obviously amateur. They don't have a lot of money behind them. And you can tell, and you're gonna be able to tell, and that's just the way it goes. I don't think this was that bad. Shitty movie, yes, but measuring the quality, if you want to call it that, in terms of the context of other tier 5 movies, it's okay. I've seen worse. And similarly to the last two movies which I've watched today, it's only around an hour long. It's like an hour and five minutes, so I always appreciate that it's not, you know, philosophy of a knife dog shit levels of length. So that's always nice. Although I must say, literally eating another girl must be the weirdest fetish I've seen in a hot minute. And yes, there's cannibalism. Lots and lots of cannibalism in this film. Although in practice, it's really... It's more like you're looking at two Japanese girls drenched in colored corn syrup. <laughs> but yeah, still tough. For me. Ruffy Tuffy. As they say. That was absolutely diabolical. Holy shit. Yo! We did it! Tier 5 is done, as is the challenge. I almost can't believe I actually did it. I must say I'm proud of myself. I really am. There's nobody who can say anything that will make me think any less of the absolutely Herculean task that I just completed. This was absolute madness. I can honestly say this was one of the toughest things I've ever done. It's up there with like finishing my master's degree. It's, it was really rough. <laughs> it was really rough, but for different reasons, obviously. This one was much more mentally and emotionally draining. 
Uh, I think tier four was by far the biggest hurdle. In hindsight, I should not have been as afraid of tier five as I was, but you can always, you know, you can always be more clever after the fact. But yeah, this was definitely tough. If nothing else, just for the sheer amount of crazy films that I've seen at this point. I mean, man, it was so much and I'm actually so exhausted. But I'm here, I'm proud of myself, I'm proud that I did it. And I hope that if anyone is mad enough to actually watch this video, which I don't expect, I mean, honestly, I've been mostly recording this for my own sanity, but <clears throat> if there's anyone out there, first of all, congratulations on making it through. What the hell, dude? That's crazy. And secondly, whatever you do, don't do what I did. Please don't take me as an example. Take me as a warning, <laughs> okay? Because I've, do I've been doing better, trust me. I've been doing much better than I'm doing right now. So, yeah. Wouldn't recommend anybody replicate this little stunt. Definitely, if anything, I would hope the opposite would happen and the person would take it as a reason why they won't have to watch it because now you have all the information about it and I hope that that satisfies your morbid curiosity. If it doesn't, then you just have this information now and I'm sorry, but that's your problem now. <laughs> so deal with it the way you gotta deal with it. But whatever you do, don't do what I did. Please, just don't. It's not worth settling your soul for this shit. Just trust me. With that being said, I do have some finishing comments on various things. The first thing I want to do is just clarify why I'm not moving further down the iceberg. And in doing that, I'll be talking about the tiers that we, in theory, still, quote, have left. So the first tier that we are missing, so to speak, intentionally, uh, but that we are missing is Tier 6. Now, Tier 6 are Mondo films, also known as shockumentaries or exploitation documentaries. And in case you need a brush up, I'll give you one. They are not movies. They are, they're basically just recordings of real violence and real death and real dead bodies. According to description and research, they vary quite a lot in severity, but in general, you do have to be able to stomach some really gruesome shit in order to get through Tier 6 unscathed, which is basically code language for you either work as a paramedic on the daily anyway, and for that reason you can handle it, or you work with something similar, or you're just a psychopath. Those are kind of like the requirements for Tier 6. Which is a bit funny and sounds very judgmental when I say it out loud, but that's the general community sentiment that I can find when I do the research on what this stuff is. Allegedly, some of them are not actually that bad, but that doesn't change the fact that you still mentally have to sort of excuse or get over the fact that you're watching real things, right? This is no longer fictional, and that's that's what makes it weird. Some of it is allegedly fake though, so it kind of blurs the lines with some of it. Like for example, Faces of Death is apparently almost entirely fake or it's like mostly fake. And the band from television stuff has some violent uh, stuff in it and some gross moments, but it's more of kind of like a disturbing version of what you would see on True TV anyway. Uh, not that I know what true TV is, I actually don't, but that's what people are saying online, so take that for what you will, I guess. And then there's the really truly disgusting shit like Faces of Gore, Traces of Death, and Rare a Dead Person, which is just actual real recordings that are just chock full of death and gore. Uh, so yeah, that's tier 6 for you. And just to repeat myself and reiter reiterate to be completely clear, the reason I'm not diving into this is not just because I don't know for a fact that it's not illegal in my country. I don't think it is, and I don't think that anyone would come knocking on my door. I'm not expecting the local authorities to pay attention to me because I'm watching Tier 6 stuff, but it is at the level of, like, 
I'm not gonna sell my soul for this shit because I don't want to watch real stuff that isn't movies anymore, if that makes sense. So is it legal? Is it not legal? I'm not 100% sure. That might depend on where you live in the world, to be honest. I mean, there's a reason why some of this shit is literally called banned from television, right? So I would say proceed with caution, but to be honest, my real advice is don't proceed at all. Just don't even be here. Why are you even here? Don't, don't even do research on this stuff. Just fucking forget about it. And that leads us to tier 7, which is literally just incredibly disgusting and weird and bizarre fetish porn. Also not something that I'm particularly interested in spending my time watching. And again, I have no interest in putting myself on a watch list, so not doing it. And according to descriptions, it's also not worth watching. It's just gross stuff, and if you're curious about that, then I don't know what to tell you. I'm not. And then, of course, lastly, there is, you know, in theory, Tier 8, which is just the really horrible recordings where mm, it's for sure not legal anymore. Um, I mean, allegedly, so, some of this stuff is supposedly legal and some of it is illegal. But realistically, if the Tier 8 is supposed to be interpreted as the end of the iceberg, the bottom of the barrel of what human beings produce on video, then we are talking about snuff films. If you think about sites like Best Gore and Live Leak and documenting reality, this is where they would be. Everything in this tier is disgusting and in my opinion should not exist. I hate even thinking about the idea that snuff films might exist out there. I just hate everything about it. In the actual iceberg that Wendigoon goes uh, through, it is gore mixtapes a lot of it. Uh, that's what you would call it, but as far as I'm concerned, it all falls under the same shitty category of snuff, real gore, dog shit. So that's tier 8 for you. And obviously I'm not gonna explain why I'm not gonna watch any of that. I just... I have no comments on that stuff. Absolutely no comments on it. I think I was like 13 or 14 years old when I heard about snuff existing. Um, for the first time in my life, and I fucking hated it, and I'm 28 now, and I hate it just the same. <laughs> I don't want to think about it, I don't want to know about it, I don't want to hear about it, and I curse it to hell. I really do. My biggest hope with tier 8 stuff is that most of it is just rumors, and that most of these recordings don't actually exist. But there's also another part of me that is not very naive, that knows what humanity is capable of, so I'm just gonna leave it at that. And that is the iceberg in its entirety. One thing I would also like to talk about is that now that I'm done with my challenge, and I'm feeling the most immediate acute effects of it, I would like to just comment on my mental state a little bit. Like I said, I've been doing better. But at the same time, I also have to conclude that as down as I've been throughout this challenge as, and as much as I feel like I've had my head in a very dark hole for a very long time now, I also know that that's not gonna last. And there's gonna be a while now where I'm gonna be locking my door and I'm gonna be closing my windows and I'm going to be scared and paranoid after sundown, that's just a fact. This is how my behavior is going to be. And it's gonna settle down eventually, and maybe it'll take a week or two, maybe it'll take a month or two, but however long it's gonna take, I also know that even a challenge as crazy as what I just did isn't going to affect me in the long run. It's not going to change my personality, it's not gonna change who I am, it's not gonna change the way I view the world it has changed the way I see the world a little bit right now, but again, that's because I'm in this very dark hole right now, and uh, it's not going to have any lasting effects, I don't think. Yes, there's a reason why this stuff is marked with the not safe for life tag, because it can affect you, but like I said, I'm really not expecting any kind of long-lasting or permanent effects on myself. I'm just going to need a bit of time to stabilize, I think, is the, the way I'm seeing this right now. I'm relieved that it's over. 
that's the biggest feeling I have right now. It's mostly relief, to be honest. Yes, I'm also scared, but I've been scared throughout this entire challenge, and I've been locking my door and closing my windows for many days at this point, so I'm almost kind of used to the fear and the sh terrible sleep quality at this point, but I also know that I'll get my better, brighter side back eventually. I'm actually hopeful, and at the end of the day, I'm kind of doing just fine, I think. So yeah, I'm expecting that I'll be fine. I would also like to give a quick comment on something that Wendigoon brought up when he went through this stuff and he was done with tier 5. He was basically sitting there and he was kind of like saying that he's finding himself asking weird questions like what should art even be, what should be allowed, or not necessarily what should be allowed because that's kind of a difficult and complex question but more so the idea of should we prefer to draw a line somewhere, and if we should, where should that line be drawn? And now that I've sat through every single one of these films from start to finish, I would like to give my answer to that question to the best of my ability, and here's my answer. The line is already drawn for us, and it's drawn by society and by common consciousness. and my best bet, my best evaluation, is that that line is drawn mostly around Tier 2. Basically, I think of it this way. If I was watching one of these films and my parents or my brother or one of my friends would have walked in on me while this was on my screen, would I have had a difficult time explaining myself? And the answer to literally everything Tier 3 and down is yes, I would have a very difficult time explaining myself. I may as well give it to you straight. My parents don't know that I'm doing this challenge. Nobody that I know know that I'm doing this challenge. I haven't told anyone, except for maybe one friend. There's a reason for that, right? When you stick your head in this very dark hole for an extended period of time, it's easy to forget just how absolutely mega shunned this material is from the rest of society. It is very, very shunned, it is extremely frowned upon, and there's a reason for that. Because honestly, yes, it exists, and yes, it should be allowed to exist, but it should not be mainstream. This needs to not be mainstream. Honestly, it, it really does. There's a reason why you're not going to proudly, at lunch, at the office, in your workplace, talk to your colleagues about how fun it was for you to watch The Human Centipede Part 2. So imagine if you take The Human Centipede Part 2 and then crank it up to basically what we have in Tier 4 and 5, and it's like, I, I think you're, you're starting to realize that your orders of magnitude beyond what is commonly socially acceptable to even talk about, let alone watching. So yeah, um, my answer to Wendigoon's question is, we have a line, it has been drawn artificially by society and common consciousness. That's my best answer to that. But I also don't think that you can just disregard every creative thing just because you don't like it and because it's too extreme and it's too much for you. So I wouldn't say that this stuff shouldn't exist. I think that it should exist, and it does exist, and is here, but it, it shouldn't be spread... Uh, it shouldn't be spread out necessarily in terms of, like, what's normal. It needs to stay not normal. That's what I'm trying to say. And I don't think that it will ever be normal, and that's a good thing. That is a very good thing. I mean, my mom can't even watch The Lord of the Rings because it's too violent and scary for her, so imagine how a normal human being would feel about you talking about my chans daily life. Yeah. Probably don't bring that to your dinner party. So that would be my, that would be my answer to that. But I can understand why Wendigoon is asking questions like that, because I'm asking questions like that after every single one of these fucking films. Because... If you're a normal, empathetic human being, it is difficult to, to get through 
the sheer amount of darkness here, even in tier 5, which was easier than tier 4, it's still difficult. It's still quite brutal, and there's a lot of it. And you do kind of get that feeling after every movie where it's like, why does this exist, and should it? So I understand the questions. I have them myself every time, so yeah. The last thing I would like to do is, in the spirit of honesty and a bit of fun, I would like to give out some awards. This might be obvious, but scariest movie, most disturbing movie, toughest movie of tier three goes to Cannibal Holocaust. So the thing about it is that tier three has a lot of nastiness in it. If I had to pick one from tier three that was kind of overall, but I've seen it before and I'm allowed to pick it, then I might go with, with Martyrs or perhaps Salo or a Serbian film. They're all tough, uh, but Cannibal Holocaust was the one that I hadn't seen that stuck with me the most. It's a pretty difficult one, and you do have to mentally prepare yourself for some well-done hyper-realism when you sit down for that one, in my opinion. So definitely a tough one. The same award, but for Tier 5, goes to, of course, My Chan's Daily Life. We've just went over it. And, yeah, not easy. Not an easy watch at all. And if you read the manga, it's even worse. So, that's the one I gotta give it to. Of course, Tier 4 being the toughest one of them all, the winner of the most disturbing, most difficult movie of Tier 4 is going to be the most disturbing movie overall, in my opinion. Obviously, these are just my takes, so this is all extremely subjective, but let's have a bit of fun and go with the subjectivity. And the award for Tier 4, and for the entire challenge overall, goes to, of course, the one and only Guinea Pig. Oh man, Guinea Pig very quickly became the yardstick for how I viewed every other movie in this entire challenge, uh, until the end of it. That goddamn film is out to get you. Like, it is, it's just a genuinely mean-spirited depiction of pure agony. It's so evil, it's so mean, and um, yeah, it's a downright satanic movie. When you think of guinea pig, you're thinking this is the ultimate kind of like the grandfather of all Japanese nastiness, and there's no Japanese film that was made since guinea pig that tops it in terms of downright malevolence on display. So that's my take on that. Most disgusting abortion, aka technically worst, I hated the most because it's so shit movie, award goes to Slaughtered Vomit Dolls by Lucifer Valentine. My god, I hated that one. It had some, some things in it that made it scary and made it very disturbing, and you're not going to sleep well after watching it, but at the end of the day, it really is just... The, the editing is so insanely bad, it is absolutely epilepsy, comatose-inducing levels of shit editing. And it just pissed me off. Honestly, it felt like a complete waste of my time. I got so pissed off. I don't know if I've ever witnessed a technically worse made movie. And that says a lot, because I've seen women's flesh my red guts, and that was god-awful as well, because the only appeal of that movie is the gore, and it still manages to somehow technically fuck up the gore. So that, that makes women's flesh my red guts, it's really high up there in terms of shitty production and just a technically poorly made movie, but I still gotta give it to Lucifer Valentine for that editing, it really, it's... It's such a bad film, actually, just in every way. On every metric that you can measure a film, it fucking sucks so much ass. It's difficult to describe in words how bad it is and how much I don't recommend it. We, of course, have to give an award to the biggest snooze fest, aka the most... I don't know if disappointing is the correct word, but I'm definitely vacuum cleaning my room while this movie is on because it's so intensely boring. That kind of award goes to... 
Well, it's a bit difficult, actually. I think I might make a shared for first place between philosophy of a knife and eccentric psycho cinema. Which, the thing that those two films have in common is that they are actually not one film. Philosophy of a Knife has two parts, and is therefore technically two films, and Eccentric Psycho Cinema apparently has up to like seven entries, although I couldn't find... Most of them I couldn't find, so I couldn't get my hands on them, but I watched the first two of them, and yeah, it's absurdly boring, it's just really slow. The thing that Philosophy of a Knife and Eccentric Psycho Cinema have in common is that they somehow manage to take something that is some of the worst stuff that a human being can do to another human being and make it so boring and so slow that it feels like the most mundane, repetitive thing in the entire universe. I don't know how you manage to achieve that, but these films do. It, it's... they must have put some kind of magic into it. Some kind of magical potion. I don't know. <laughs> It was so boring. I would like to give an award as well to the least ethical film. This is a film that I'm giving an award to not because it has animal cruelty in it or because it has very suspicious production surrounding it where maybe some people were not treated very well. No, I'm giving this award to juvenile crime for the sheer fact that it really, really should not exist and it only does a disservice to the insane and absurd tragedy of what actually happened to that poor girl. I hate the fact that this movie exists. I'm done talking about it now because I don't even want to think about it. I also want to give an award to the biggest surprise of the challenge. This one goes to Where the Dead Go to Die. That is a very surprisingly uh, tough and difficult movie, which is weird considering the technicalities of what it is and how it was made. So I definitely came into that one expecting it to be a little more tolerable than it actually was. It's gonna be one of those things where if you don't know what you're getting into, it will absolutely catch you off guard and it might fuck you up quite heavily. So it's a bit of a dangerous one, I think. I mean, the sheer bleakness of where the dead go to die is truly on a different level in and of itself. It's bleaker than Cannibal Holocaust. It's so bleak that it might even be darker than Girl Hell 1999, and that says a lot. Last, but definitely not least, I absolutely need to give an award to the funniest movie of the challenge. I know what you guys are expecting, but to your surprise, I'm giving this award to neither House of a Thousand Corpses nor The Necrophiles. I'm actually going to give this to Necromantic. Necromantic is incredibly disgusting, and it's not an easy watch, but the reason I have to, <laughs> to, <laughs> to give it this award is because sometimes humor is the defense mechanism that gets us through difficult and dark things. It's very intentionally funny because Necromantic kind of makes fun of its own extremism in that weird, bizarre, American psycho kind of way where you're supposed to laugh at how insane this character is. And I definitely did. I definitely did, and I think the film kind of achieved what it wanted in that regard, which is a positive. And with that, I don't know if I have anything else to say. I've been thinking about whether I have some kind of a lesson or anything that I've learned from watching this. You know, you can I can talk about the good things in life and the bad things in life and, you know, try and draw some kind of perspective from this, but I think that would be disingenuous to do because, honestly, this whole experience has been so depraved and weird and dark that maybe there's nothing to learn from it as such for me, other than the fact that maybe some things just need to be survived more so than they need to be learned from, you know? And I've gone through this, it's done, and that's it. I mean, this is not exactly the peak of human consciousness and human potential, so I don't know what kind of lesson is expected for me to draw from this. I don't think I really have one. 
I guess I could answer the question of did I satisfy my morbid curiosity that I had when I started this? And the answer is very obviously yes, I absolutely did. But that was achieved a long time ago. Like, that curiosity was actually fulfilled at Guinea Pig. I pretty much just did the rest of it for the challenge and out of sheer stubbornness, if I'm being honest. Which you could argue is not really a good reason to do it. But I'm proud that I got it done. Was it worth it? Um, I'm not sure if I can say that it was worth it. Probably not. But in a sense, for me it was, because I made this video out of it, and that to me is more meaningful than so many other things in life. So why not? So yeah, was it worth it? No, but also kind of yes. I will say it wasn't without a cost. That's probably how I would phrase it. It cost me something, but I got it. I can say that I did it. And I'm probably the only person within a 100 mile radius of where I live who can say that they've done it. Not that I would ever say that in public uh, talk to anyone ever, but <laughs> I know that I've done it. <laughs> I'll be walking down the street tomorrow looking at all these people and I'll be thinking, yep, not a single one of you guys have done what I've done and seen what I've seen. That is 100% factual, just statistically. In fact, I don't know if there's anyone on the planet that's done exactly what I've done here. Well, maybe there is. I mean, statistically, it would be reasonable to assume that a dozen people or maybe a couple dozen people have done this. Maybe, I think. I don't know if I'm over or underestimating that, but I'm realistically the only one in my local area who's done this, that's for damn sure. I mean, I would hope so, at least. Anything else would be very surprising to me. But I guess you never know, right? I'm not God, so... Who knows? Man, what an insane adventure. I guess I do apologize for putting that image from the manga of My Chan's Daily Life at the end of that review, but I kind of want to keep it because... I have had every single picture for every single movie in this entire video. Intentionally, I've chosen things without gore and blood on them. So if you actually go through all of my reviews, you'll notice that there's not a single one of the pictures that have any blood on them. And I wanted to end on a high note. So if that was a bit shocking for you guys, I'm sorry, but this was always going to be explicit material one way or another. And I think you guys knew that. If not, then I do apologize, genuinely. I'm not trying to upset anyone. But I also feel like a part of you knew the risk of what you got into, and it's just one image. I think you'll be fine. An image from a manga, which is fictional and a drawing. So hopefully you'll be okay. I don't know if I have much else to say to round this out, because I'm not expecting anyone to actually watch this video, let alone watch through all of it and listen to what I'm saying here at the end, but I can at least try and give some kind of conclusion. I guess I'm just gonna say thanks for listening, and please take care of yourself, take care of your mental health, stick your head out of the dark hole that you've been in just from watching this video. <sighs> Is this the toughest thing I've ever done? No. No, it's not. It's not. But it wasn't easy. Anyway, I've gotta go edit this absolute monstrosity of a file. So, I'm gonna go do that. If you'll have me excused, I'm probably gonna go play some Stardew Valley. Or maybe watch some fucking Powerpuff Girls after this. The good lord knows. I need something like that.